you damn lucky you got an ear left. So you can hear episode 008 of A Review to a Kill, which is a look back on the James Bond film franchise presented to you by fanboysanonymous.com. Uh, I'd tell you who I am, but uh, names is for tombstones, baby. <laughs> <laughs> then again, you already know I'm Tony Mango. I'm joined by Callum Wiggins. What's up, hunky? <laughs> right on, brother. <laughs> and Robert Felice. Me. Close off. <laughs> Wait a minute. Where? You're not my instructor. Where's Mr. Bleaker? <laughs> What we're talking about today, as you can tell by the title and the thumbnail and everything else that's going on here, is we're talking about Live and Let Die, the first of the Roger Moore James Bond films, the eighth film in the franchise, the ninth episode of A Review to a Kill, some other numbers <laughs> I'll just toss out. Uh, we're going to do what we normally do here. We're going to break down the seven different elements. We're going to talk about the movie from top to bottom, talk about whether or not we think this is shaken or stirred. And everything else, and we in and uh, we in and in. We invite you to join in on the discussion by leaving a comment below. Go ahead and do that in particular on the YouTube video. And while you're over there, if you like this, hit the like button. That's kind of the point. That's why it's the like button. Hit the share button if you got any f uh, family or friends or anybody that you think would be enjoying this series as well. Uh, if you feel so inclined to join us on the Patreon side of things to help us grow a little bit and share uh, some spare change that you got with us. Open up your wallets over there, patreon.com slash fanboys anonymous, and you can help sponsor some things going forward. Uh, make sure that at the very least that you're subscribed to the YouTube channel here. Ring that little notification bell as well. And if you want to pick up a t-shirt, check out the merchandise on TeePublic and Redbubble. Merchandise stuff and everything else out of the plugs, out of the way. Let's get into the movie. Let's start off with the foreign language titles. I'm enjoying uh, looking at these because these are things I never really looked at before. But uh, the working title of the book was The Undertaker's Wind. Which immediately makes me think of The Undertaker from pro wrestling. You know, if yeah. people aren't aware, uh, smartoutmoment.com is the other thing that we do here uh, under a mango tree. So, you know, if you are into The Undertaker and Mark Calloway and everything else that's happening with pro wrestling, uh, The Undertaker's wind. Uh, it's The Undertaker. He doesn't have much wind these days. <laughs> it's if he farts in a match or something, I guess. Um, some of the other titles, though, were Kill to Live. In Turkey. Uh, Greece titled this James Bond Agent 007 Live and Let Others Die. Kind of a mouthful. Uh, France had this as Live and Leave to Die. <laughs> uh, Poland had Allow to Leave Alone to Die. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> which is pretty depressing. <laughs> but easily, easily my favorite goes to Japan. The dead slave, it is them to die. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Why the hell would they name it that? I don't the, know. Dead, <laughs> the dead slave, I, I, I really it is them to die. <laughs> Gee, oh, that's just fucking brutal, isn't it? <laughs> yep. I can't imagine Paul McCartney saying all those words in a song. What does it matter to you? If they were dead to sleep, it is them to die. It's like, what? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so, the title. Let's talk about the title before we get into the movie. It's one of my favorite titles in the franchise. What do you guys think? It's great. It's, it's a cool title, yeah. It feels I, like it would just like, fit as like, a standard just movie outside of the franchise. I love my puns. It's a great uh, turn of phrase. I think it's got like a... Uh, a violence to it, obviously, but at the same time, it's got kind of a poetic element. And I like when the movies are like that, like, you know, like tomorrow never dies. World's not enough. Uh, the world's not enough. Doesn't really have too much of a violent edge to it. But to me, those are my favorite types of bond titles rather than something like Goldfinger, where it's just like, right, I wonder if this one's about Goldfinger, you know, or when you get a little bit too, where you're trying too hard and it's like, to die is to live another die today because dying is tomorrow. And, you know, and then you're just like, all right, you're, you're, you're getting into parody territory here. Living that die, though. 
great title. And the um, second of the books. So they don't follow too much of this. Uh, they do take elements and they put them in different movies. There's a character in another movie that gets partially mangled by sharks, which would have happened in this uh, story. There's uh, characters that pop up in other films that are kind of inspired by other characters that are in this. But we'll talk about that a little bit here and there. First things first, let's talk about the uh, gun barrel. We got a new Bond, so we got a new gun barrel because it wouldn't make any sense if it was, you know, Connery. No hat, no jumping, no kneeling. What do you guys think about more doing this kind of, I guess you'd say rigid sort of pose for the gun barrel? I didn't like it as much. Just thought it was too, almost too stiff. It's more, it's more what you'd expect going forward with the uh, the James Bond gun barrel thing than the the, the leap to the knee that uh, Connery would do. So I liked it in that aspect of it. I think one thing I noticed about the uh, more ones the fact that he grabs his arm. Yeah. When he's shooting, steadies the uh, the shot. Yeah, which I guess is kind of what you'd expect. If this one felt more like what I would imagine these to be over the uh, Connery ones. My least favorite ones are the ones that are a little bit more over the top. Like I think that uh, Craig is sort of, he looks like he just wants to get it done. <laughs> kind of. I love uh, Brosnan's. Uh, he just seems like this cool, suave type of dude. But the more one, I kind of like how he is a little rigid because it makes it sort of seem to me like he's he's steadied his shot. Um, I don't love the score version that they deal with here. And we'll talk about more music a little bit later on, but there, you know, it's a different incarnation of the bomb theme with every gun barrel for the most part. And this one's not my favorite. We start off with the United Nations where someone replaces the United Kingdom's representatives earpiece with something that makes this cartoony sound. And he just keels over dead. <laughs> it's just like, brrr. He's like, ah, I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. It's voodoo. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm going to say this a lot throughout the entire film, just as a spoiler, but what, why the fuck did they do that? <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> I don't know what that's supposed to be. Because it doesn't lead into anything. I mean, obviously they talk about how like certain number of agents or people over there have died in different areas, but it's like, it's not like this guy had any backstory or like was seen as being particularly relevant. He was just the UK representative at the the UN. Obviously, that's a big deal, but it's like, okay. It's not like we heard the words UN throughout the entire rest of the film. Yeah, or I mean, like the UN agents, is right? stopping something. Yeah, the first three, uh, the three people that get killed at the beginning of it are all um, MI6 agents or British agents in some fashion. Why is an MI6 agent the head of... Like our representative at the United Nations. Surely this this is a profession he's supposed to be working in the shadows. I don't think he's supposed to be MI6. I think that he's just supposed to be because they. I think that the line is something like three of our men or something. So it's just sort of like, well, he's a UK guy, you know. Um, going vague enough. I still just don't understand how pushing a little plunger on something where you, if anything, he'd be like, ah, my ear, <laughs> not just like ah, keel over. Most people don't even bat an eye. <laughs> you know, they're just sort of, oh, all right, what happened to Bill? Or whatever. Uh, I wanted to create like a meme version of that where it's just like they put the thing on and then it's just that person whispering, it's free real estate. <laughs> <laughs> or the, uh, I love refrigerators. <laughs> Hail Hydra, you know. Yeah. Or some terrible song. Like they, uh, I don't know, what's like oh, a Friday by Rebecca Black. Yeah, <laughs> version of that. Um, one of the people that actually bothers to look up is the representative from the Caribbean island of San Monique. You guys ever been? No. No, and I, I don't really feel compelled to after, <laughs> after this. Yeah, because it's not real. <laughs> it's okay, okay, that's good. They were like, that's yeah, enough. we can't make one of these uh, actual countries make it seem like their leader is this drug lord and all that so let's just make one up it sounds real though you know san monique sounds like you'd get a pamphlet and it'd be like you know visit san monique it's got these beautiful i don't know snake dens <laughs> and, uh, that where you're going for the honeymoon time i mean maybe 
if I could, you know, try to convince her. I'll be like, look, you like uh, like dark macabre stuff? There's Baron Savity. <laughs> we'll do this weird funky dance. You can uh, take a ride down on a grave. <laughs> so this is the fastest that we've ever been introduced to a Bond girl. And I think a main villain, too. We're a minute and 57 seconds in and we see both of them. It's pretty uh, different. Pretty much all the other ones, it's like just some some goon, uh, you know, Bond kills a mook, or, you know, whatever. And we get like, there you go, there's the main villain, there's the main girl. And a guy just going like, bah, my ears. But um, we continue on with a couple different deaths. Uh, one of them is an agent is checking out the Filet of Soul. Great pun. Love the name of that restaurant. And uh, there's this great sequence where there's a death parade march going on. And he says, uh, whose funeral is it? The dude next to him, yours, just stabs him. <laughs> He's dead immediately. I don't understand how they're able to put the coffin on top of the guy and pick him up. I'd like to revisit talking about The Undertaker for a second. Because <laughs> the Undertaker's wind. I, I now think that that is that all of The Undertaker disappearing acts make perfect sense. Because clearly... <laughs> In 1973, they were just able to put a casket over somebody and pick them up in the casket. <laughs> Nobody's the wiser. I know how they did the stunt for the actual thing is they had these bars inside that he grabbed onto and then they just picked him up. But like, even if that was uh, like a hollow casket, how would he not just <laughs> like they got to get underneath him for that, you know? Maybe it's one of those contraptions that can open when you push one way, but then it stays shut when you push force in the other way. It's got like a little clasp or something. Yeah, something like that. I mean, <laughs> listen, they've got so much more fish to fry. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm not going to dwell on that one too much. Also, this scene takes a much more, uh, an entirely different meaning. Again, I'm bringing up another meme of that regard as well, but that meme of the um, the guys dancing with the coffee yeah. on their shoulders. <laughs> I forgot about okay. that, yeah. Yeah, because they just go, you know, I mean, this is the way that apparently some things, I've never been to New Orleans, but that they do the whole like celebrate the dead type of thing. And I think it's great when it's just like, you know, like, it's just like, oh, okay, there's a funeral and people are crying. As soon as they pick up the guy, but I'm like, yeah, the guy's dead. Uh, oh, when the saints, oh, when the saints, kind of, you know, happy. <laughs> And then uh, finally in San Monique, there's a ritual of some sorts, I don't know what, going on. And this guy gets, I guess you could say, bitten by a snake. It's a pretty terrible way of... (laughs) (laughs) It's pretty bad, isn't it? This entire movie feels like a filler episode of a great series that you just go, I don't know, fuck that one. (laughs) Yeah, I and you'd... say that I was doing breaking it down bit by bit, but as an overall thing about this movie, this movie is unparodiable <laughs> because it's a parody of itself. And you know what though? It's so enjoyable. <laughs> like, I will. I mean, we'll talk about aspects of it, but it's just. I, I mean, the only way that you can actually do an effective parody <clears throat> of this movie is to try and make it serious. Yeah, to do a complete opposite. Yeah, <laughs> because this movie, like. I knew it was going to change once more took over because I've known, I know enough to know it's going to change. I didn't realize it did 180 in about in like a couple of, in a couple of scenes of this movie. It's a completely different franchise now. Yeah. And it's so weird to follow up diamonds are forever with this, isn't it? Because it's like diamonds is batshit crazy. And on her majesty's secret service, it has some weird moments here and there, but it's primarily a serious movie. Diamonds are Forever is just nuts, and it's just poorly written, and it's just garbage. And this one, I feel like it's not badly written. It's just weird. I, I kind of feel like it's Bond crossed with Police Academy. <laughs> A little bit, yeah. I, don't, I never read the book. I, I said that before. I've never read any of the books. Uh, but I know that the book is not as weird as this is there there's weird elements to it and some of the stuff does carry over but their philosophy was pretty much like well if we can throw a joke in there let's try to throw a joke and uh, this would be kind of interesting and whatever 
And the whole movie is pretty much a joke. It the movies get into that rhythm even more. Like it, there's not a single Roger Moore film that's truly serious. So this is like you don't say. Uh, this is about as serious as they get for his run. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> there are very serious moments in the other movies and there are more serious plots, but we've got a a, a guy who uh wants to blow up the world. We've got a uh we've got fish people kind of like <laughs> I understand why he was the bond chosen to be in Stice World. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is ridiculous. <laughs> <clears throat> so let's talk about the opening titles uh, people will consider this blasphemy but i don't love the song live and let die so i asked you about this the other day and i just assumed it was because of your unreasonable hatred of the beatles and all things <laughs> beetle but after you watch this movie and for the hundredth time they're going do do Dude, I went, okay, I see what I see the problem. He just it's too much. This theme is 90% awesome. There is so much to like about this theme. And then it goes, Well, what does it matter? And then uh-huh. it's just like then it just completely kills it for me. It's just that that I don't know what in their mind who like the guys putting this together for, yeah, we need to do this little transition into like a little bit of a a jokey. Mm-hmm like folky aspects of this entire song and just like no the rest of it's so good why do you ruin it like that yeah when you do the whole beginning of it yeah uh, uh you know you did you know you did you know you did and everything like up to that point uh say so live and let die bah, bah. it's it's awesome I don't like the transition though, right after that, where it just goes da 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 because it just switches tempo a little bit that's not the end of the world, but it very much when, once you get to the, what does it matter to you? That kills everything. And then it just goes back to the super fast part and whatever. And I don't, I don't like a single Beatles song. I know people are going to go crazy about that. I'll make you feel even worse. I don't like Elvis either. And people are usually like, Oh, is it Elvis or the Beatles? And I'm like, you could take both of them. And just, you know. All right. You're, you're wrong on the Beatles. I'll, I'll play with you. A little bit on Elvis, because... Can't Help Falling in Love with You is an absolutely amazing song. One of the best songs ever written, as long as somebody other than Elvis sings it. <laughs> like, that kind of a thing. And I like Hey Jude, but the only version of Hey Jude that I like, that I've come across, is an instrumental. I don't know why you the one part of Hey Jude you don't like is the part that everybody loves. What the... Hey Jude, hey Jude, hey Jude, hey Jude, hey Jude, hey Jude. thing. That's the na na part, Tony. Everybody loves <laughs> uh, the that. The na na na, yeah, I don't really like that either. That's but, wrong with you. But yeah, I mean, like, I get why this song is super popular because it was Paul McCartney and the Wings. But just because it's popular doesn't mean it's the best. And to me, it ranks pretty low on the list. It's not. Uh, most people, it's like towards the the top, if not their favorite. Out of the ones that we've had so far, the only ones that I have it above are Underneath the Mango Tree, Mr. Kiss Kiss, Bang Bang, and We Have All the Time in the World. And I honestly, it's about 50-50 with We Have All the Time in the World. You're, well, it's going to be near the top for me. I'll put it right under Goldfinger right now. I mean, this above, is a great uh, song. Above Diamonds? Above Diamonds, yeah. I'm going to move that down on your list then. <laughs> I mean, it's not going to be at my top. Both of you already know what my top is, and we'll get to it. But this is a great song. I just feel like they played it a little too much throughout this entire film. The uh, score itself is done by George Martin. And I don't like the score in this movie either. I, I wanted John Barry. This guy's too much of like a 70s vibe, and it's a little bit too hokey. I think it kind of fit the theme what they were going for for this one it's not it's not again it's not the greatest and it was really super apparent to me because again i don't i just don't listen to music when yeah. it's outside of the title thing but uh but yeah so it didn't offend me well they're knee deep in the 70s we have left the 
swinging 60s. We are on to a very funky and very strange 1970s, apparently. And eh, like Callum says, I don't pay attention to too much, but I can understand why you say it feels too 70s, but I guess they were trying to move it into that decade. By the time we get to Free Your Eyes Only, you're going to be able to hear it no matter what, because then we're full-blown funky 70s, and you got, like, kind of music and stuff. That one's the worst. Um, Director Guy Hamilton, uh, his first reaction on hearing the Live and Let Die theme was, yeah, that's good for a demo, but when are you going to do the real record? (laughs) And they were pretty much like, that's that's the thing. And, uh, you know, there was like a little bit of uh, pushback or whatever. They didn't want this to be uh, Paul McCartney singing. They wanted a, a black singer, somebody like a Diana Ross. Diana Ross was also apparently going to play solitaire for a little bit. But uh, McCartney was pretty much like, well, if you want me to do this, I'm doing it. And that's it. So Mm. I think we might uh, have had a better thing if maybe some other things would have been tweaked. But yeah, I know a lot of people are going to be disappointed to hear that we're not putting this as the top of the top, the best ever. I'm not not a fan. I do like the uh, the visuals, the woman turning into the flaming uh, skull. I like that. That's cool. Just giant eyes staring at you. Yeah. Constantly. They go back to it, I think, three times in the thing because it's the one idea they had. But it is a cool idea. I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the visuals were good. It was definitely more impactful than previous Bond movies. Yeah, and I mean, you still have the naked women silhouettes, and it's still kind of the same sort of stuff. But you got a little that's bit gonna of gonna be some the same fire until, and... That's gonna be the same for a while. So yeah, I you think got, that you got kind of get used to those really. You pretty much don't get too crazy beyond Naked Women Silhouette until maybe Goldeneye? I, I mean, I've seen uh, the one for the, the World Is Not Enough, and that's weird. So, <laughs> Yeah, then you get, well, instead of Naked Women Silhouettes, it's uh, Oil Women Silhouettes. And, I mean, they, they all have basically naked women dancing around. That's, that's the, the trope more than anything. It's just how they do it. Sometimes it's just a silhouette. Sometimes they're floating in water. Sometimes they're Floating in space. <laughs> sometimes sometimes they're, they're doing gymnastics on a gun. Sometimes they're doing that. Uh, sometimes an octopus pops out of the gun. <laughs> yes, it's what it is. What it is. But the uh, intro is out of the way. Outside of the fact that we need to intro our new Bond. Uh, in a different parallel reality, it's not Roger Moore. It's Clint Eastwood. <laughs> They offered yeah, him the I've part. So bad. I've been, I mean, to be fair, like Moore's an acquired taste, but again, you just shouldn't have an American in this role. No. It, it just I doesn't mean, work. I can't imagine any American being able to pull off Bond. I can't imagine, you know, most people being able to pull off Bond, but especially like a Clint Eastwood, where he's, you know, very like gritting his teeth, you know, uh, what do you make my day kind of guy. He's he's like a cowboy type. If he would just be, you know, oh, hey, Q, whatever. Uh, like, that, no. <laughs> I can't imagine that whatsoever. Burt Reynolds apparently was offered the part, too. So, Again. So ridiculous. Can't imagine Burt Reynolds with that stupid mustache. You know. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, just what I mean, you talk about like an alternate reality. In another alternate reality, Roger Moore's already been Bond. Yeah, he was offered the part several movies before this. Uh, I think it was the first one he might have been offered would have been You Only Live Twice. Yeah. And he ended up, he had to you have know, prior commitments with The Saint. And I forget the name of the other show. Persuaders, I think. Never seen it. So they wanted him for a while. And that's kind of a running theme in this franchise too, is they talk to these people, they want them, and then they have to wait a little bit. They do it with uh, Dalton and they do it with Brosnan. They didn't do it with Connery. Uh, I don't, I mean, not with Connery, uh, with Craig, if I remember correctly. I think he kind of just came out of the blue, like after uh, Brosnan, but at least with uh, with this, they were looking at Eastwood, <laughs> which I just, I can't imagine that playing well. Eastwood feels like 
he's like a bizarro Bond. Like, maybe the star of another franchise. Like, uh, I, the only way I can compare it to is a video game thing for some reason. But, yeah, Assassin's Creed was born out of, well, we're going to make a Prince Persia game. And it's going to be, he'll be an assassin this time. And then it's never mind, we'll just make a whole other franchise. That's what I feel like Clint Eastwood as Bond would be. It's like, oh, let's have Eastwood be Bond. Yeah, fuck it. This is a whole other franchise now. He's like, you know what? I'll make my own James Bond with Blackjack Ogres. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Doesn't the regular Bond have enough Blackjack? <laughs> <laughs> that he has Chimenda fur. <laughs> He doesn't need to pay for sex. Right. <laughs> he just, true. He just says, I'll buy you a drink. And then she's like, all right. <laughs> oh, no, we've got the be- we have the best seduction in this entire franchise Ooh. so far coming up. Yeah. So we'll talk about that. So here's a little bit of, that's weird. Um, Roger Moore's five years older than Connery was in Diamonds Are Forever. You don't say. I think he looks younger. He does look younger in this one. I mean, to be fair, Connery looks pretty old by the end of that thing, but... But that doesn't last long for more. No. Uh, but um, yeah, he looks he looks fine in this movie. He looks more, like he's a pretty esteemed one. More ages between uh, the man with the golden gun and the spy who loved me. He ages like ten years, and then from spy who loved me to like for your eyes only, he ages another five, and then from for your eyes only to view to a kill, it's like another ten. It's insane. I think it looks pretty good here, though. And in uh, The Man with the Golden Gun. Does it go downhill after that for more? Yep. <laughs> uh, poor guy. So he is very, very English. Yeah. So obviously Connery had the, the Scottish bro going on, and Lazenby, he, he did a fair enough British accent, even though he was Australian, so he's slipping in every now and again. Uh, more is so what you'd expect for like basically if you just went up to any american this is probably what they assume every british person sounds like either that or like full-blown cockney your chimney sweep yeah. from our past kind of thing yeah he's just very very uh, well posh upper class in the way that he speaks he just doesn't feel as he doesn't feel in any way as visceral as connery could sometimes sound no i mean they wrote the Moore films completely different than they wrote the Connery films because they even talk about this. I forget if it's um, Tom Mankiewicz or if it's uh, Hamilton, but somebody in the commentary had talked about it. They're like, if we wrote a scene where uh, Bond sleeps with a woman, stabs her and then says to uh, uh, the person, I don't have anything to cut my meat with Connery could pull it off. We couldn't do that with Moore. He would just seem like a jerk. (laughs) I don't want to see that scene now, though. Um, no, he he just he doesn't look like he comes across as a guy who's particularly threatening. No, he comes across he comes across as very suave, suave. He has that side of the Bond down pat. He can do the suave, sophisticated talk. He can cut the jokes. He can do all that other stuff. But he doesn't never comes across in any part of this movie like he feels like okay, if you mess with him, then he's going to fuck you up. And this yeah. is probably the. The roughest and toughest that he seems in the series. Oh, good. That's that's another great stuff. <laughs> oh my god, these movies are about to go real downhill. It's I don't. It's weird. It's downhill, but it's also uphill because it's fun. <laughs> so it's kind of yeah, like because yeah. And look, look at this way: you watch these movies and they're fucking hilarious in certain aspects, but you kind of feel like they're not supposed to be hilarious. It's like sometimes it's like, yeah. oh, they're actually trying to make these movies seriously. It almost feels like I'm feel like watching this. I feel like I'm reacting the same way that if I was watching an Austin Powers or something like that. It's like oh yeah, that's funny. All this stuff, all this stuff's like just ridiculous. Some of the stuff's happening. It's making me laugh, but. I'm watching a bomb. I'm actually watching an actual bomb movie, not a parody of a bomb movie. So, Keep in mind the idea wrong. of reacting to Bond when we come to Moonraker. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to make a lot more sense when we get to Moonraker. There's a certain reaction in that movie that is infamous as well. Um, so rather than do what they did the last few times and with Dr. No, uh, where there's this like mystique to introducing Bond, because remember on Our Majesty's Secret Service, they do the whole thing where they don't show him. He's obscured and eventually he pops up and it's just, you know, hi, I'm Bond, I guess. <laughs> and then uh, Diamonds Are Forever, they got the whole shadowy mystery of who we're watching or whatever. They just decide, you know what, fuck it. 
Like people know what's going on now. We're eight films deep into this. Let's just show Roger Moore in bed with a woman. And he, you know, she wakes up, he wakes up, whatever. Um, she's immediately like one more time again. <laughs> it's just like, you just woke up, huh? Sex. <laughs> and, uh, someone rings the doorbell and it's, uh, he, uh, like in the line, he says, you're not married by any chance, are you? <laughs> but it's M. And uh, M is, you know, put your uh, clothes on and pack and whatever. You got to pack for a trip. A uh, bunch of people got killed. Uh, Bond's got a great line here, too. Uh, he says one of the people was Baines. And he goes, oh, Baines. I rather liked Baines. We share the same bootmaker. <laughs> Just, okay. <laughs> M's like, mm-hmm. all right. <laughs> and uh, he distracts M from the woman that he's bedded uh, with some coffee with this espresso machine that is like this complicated type of thing back in the day. I like that M even with this bond is so pissed at him all the time. Is that all it does? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That relationship is really frosty at this. Yeah. Cantankerous as hell, right? He's like, you want some coffee, sir? You woke me up in the middle of I don't know, two in the morning or whatever the hell. And, uh, he's just sort of like, yeah, I'll have some coffee from this fucking machine. <laughs> it's like... Bond, I'll be like, we just met. I'm not the I'm not the other guy. <laughs> yeah, that's the like, happened to the other guy. The other guy. This happened exactly to the other guy. <laughs> so it turns out the woman that's in bed with him is an Italian agent from Bond's last mission, named Miss Caruso, and uh, we just don't get any kind of real information about that. It's kind of like Goldfinger at the beginning of it. it's just you know whatever. And uh, Money Penny's here. She catches Caruso sneaking around, uh, trying to grab her dress and hiding in the closet, whatever. Um, I love Money Penny. Money Penny's great. I like what she does here. Uh, I'm disappointed though. We don't get Q. No, no Q in this movie. We do get gadgets, but no Q. Yeah. Um, we'll get one bad gadget in particular. <laughs> that we'll obviously be talking about now. So the watch has a magnet in it. Uh, they do this whole thing with M, of course. Being now, M gets what this whole shit's about. Like he's M. And he's still just like, oh, you know, the fucking taxpayers are going to pay for your watch. And uh, Bond demonstrates it by attracting M's spoon from his saucer. And he's like, uh, oh, my God, or whatever. Uh, spoon, Mr. Bond. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Bond says it's powerful enough, supposedly, to deflect a bullet from long range. I'd like to try that out right now. <laughs> yeah, totally contemptuous. <laughs> How does it deflect the bullet? It what it, I can imagine it like attracts the bullet towards it because that's what it seems to do is pull metal things closer to it. But I don't know how it like. Does it have a reverse polarity to it that can send bullets for flying away and stuff like that? And if so, why does Bond never use that to that purpose in the entire movie? Right. Although I do, I do appreciate how much this gadget is used in this movie. It is one of the better used gadgets so far, and. One of the things that, if that would be like a regular going forward, you'd be like, I get it. That should be standard kind of uh, equipment. You know, everybody gets that briefcase from from Ship with Love. Everybody gets the rebreather and everybody gets the magnet watch. Like, yeah, of course. You know? Yeah. Uh, I don't really know what Bond's done to him to make him w- want to test out the theory of the bullet, but he's like, here, can you have some coffee, sir? Uh, I'll put some milk in it. And he's like, I'd like to shoot you in the face. <laughs> Just sort of. <laughs> Money Penny's a good wing girl, though. She makes sure that Em gets his coat without seeing Caruso. Yeah. She's, uh, she's, she's doing her service for, <laughs> uh, for Bond there. Yeah. She really is the most loyal of all the Bond girls. She really is. And um, Bond uses the magnet in the watch to unzip Caruso's dress. And she Which says, was brilliant. He has a delicate touch, and he says, sheer magnetism, darling. <laughs> That's one of his best lines in the entire movie. That is pure Roger Moore right there. His Bond in a nutshell. It, almost every single line that he has like that is delivered the same way, and usually with darling as his go-to uh, affectionate term for women. I think in this movie alone, he might call everybody darling. Uh, He might say darling to solitaire like seven times or so. But that's such a great line. Sheer magnetism, darling. Great. I mean, it could be worse. Sheer magnetism, sugar tits. 
Yeah. <laughs> and then they transition to a plane taking off and a woman saying, a man comes. <laughs> <laughs> he, he does. <laughs> On the plane as well, Bond. Uh, the innuendo back then when they used to try to do shit like that. You know, this kind of implication of like, all right, they're going to have sex, so let's show a plane. A man comes. He sure did. I like, I like the jokes. I like to, a man comes. Now he's getting on a plane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just make it obvious. It's so good. I love that. But this woman's looking at tarot cards. She's reading that Bond's going to travel their way. He's bringing violence and destruction with him. And Bond goes to New York. He uh, He's heading to Felix Leiter. David Hedison, the guy who plays Felix, is my favorite Felix Leiter, but not in this movie. He's the only one other than Jeffrey Wright with the Craig films to actually return in a future film. He pops up in License to Kill. And I think he's at his best there. Uh, I I like this Felix so much better than uh, the one that we got like in Goldfinger, for instance, or Diamonds Are Forever. How do you guys feel about Felix? Pretty good. Um, definitely, better, yeah, definitely better than the last one. Yeah. I, I would say he's still a bit incompetent. Yeah. And especially the part where, like, hey, what did you do, my friend? All that other stuff. Is like, yeah. Okay, <laughs> just going to leave it there. <laughs> we also get Bond's cab driver uh, is getting killed with the um, the car pulls up on the side, shoots him with a dart out of the mirror. And Bond has to reach to the front seat, grab the steering wheel. Not the best car sequence, but it's over pretty quick. It's it's okay. Yeah. There are so many chase sequences in this entire movie, but that one doesn't really register at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, even better than the tra- uh, the chase sequence, though, is the line afterward uh, that Felix wants an APB on a white pimp mobile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and then that kicks off quite an interesting film. Am I wrong here? Is that <laughs> yeah. feeling that here? It's something very of its time, as many of the Bond movies have been so far. Mm-hmm. There's a running theme with Roger Moore's films where pretty much each of them is inspired by something that's big at the time. So these are like the black exploitation type of films. The next film is going to be very much, hey, Hong Kong is in. Let's do like Kung Fu stuff. Then we're going to get into uh, eventually Star Wars is really big. So let's do Moonraker, yeah, that kind of a thing. Uh, this one's like the black exploitation stuff and they they black exploit. <laughs> it's, uh, CIA is listening into Kananga. He's well aware he's got a pre-recorded tape set up to waste their time, which I totally love. And I love Felix's line about how Kananga is knitting a flag in there. <laughs> do you want to do you want to talk about Kananga now, or do you want to wait until a bit more of a prominent part to start actually talking about it? I think we should wait. Okay, that's fine. We could dive a little deeper into some of those things. I just like that Kananga's got this tape. He's just like you know, and I think clicking the button. <laughs> just sort of like all right now, I could you oh, yeah, know let my hair good. down. <laughs> yeah, it's really well put together. And then like, Bond arrives at that uh, at a uh, voodoo shop where they've tra- tracked the uh, pimp mobile. The occult voodoo shop. The occult. Mm-hmm. Another great name. And he, he he just goes in there and he's just like, oh, I'm just browsing. It's just like, as if like a proper English gentleman, because only an English gentleman would go into a shop and just say, oh yeah, I'm just browsing. And yeah. Stuff like that. <laughs> I'm browsing around a voodoo shop. In Harlem. You know? Yeah. And I love, love, love... He grabs this arbitrary snake thing and tells the cashier woman to gift wrap it uh, lengthwise, if you don't mind. <laughs> what dick. What the fuck is that supposed to mean, lengthwise? <laughs> uh, it's there just so you can pop at him being an asshole. He's such an ass. It's so good. Uh, there's a good little swerve here, too, where the cashier is like, he's tailing. Uh, and another guy says, I've got him in my sights. And you're made to believe that they're working together, but it's actually two separate conversations because he's a CIA agent. So I like that a little bit. That's cool. There's certain other ones that basically, because the cab driver, the bomb gets into tail, the, um, the he's crew. the fucking best. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's great, obviously. So gets the 20 bucks out of him as well. Says so for 20 bucks, he takes one to a KKK cookout. Yeah. 
Yeah, so <laughs> I, I don't know what the exchange, the, the uh, inflation rate is, but you're going to have to give me a little more than $20 to do that. I, I God, $20 and I'll go to a Ku Klux Klan cookout for you. Jesus. Then you introduce to others such great lines as 125th, you got a honky on your tail. <laughs> And uh, another one says, it's easy, it's just like following a cue ball. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm going to try to look up the uh, the inflation thing here. Well, I'll just talk a little bit about the fact that you have... So this guy who's driving the cab is also part of Kananga's crew. So basically, you're listening to this, and obviously I know you talk about the CIA agent being a bit of a red herring in that regards, but you're basically listening to this, watching this thinking... Okay, so every single like black <laughs> character in this movie is associated with the bad guys. And that's just yeah. like, okay. So uh, in 1973, $20 would be worth what uh, today is $117.83. You're still going to need Still KKK. Ku <laughs> Klux Klan cookout. I don't think I'd do that for 120 bucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's enough. <laughs> right. And it does make you feel like every single black person in this entire film is a villain. So at least they've got Strutter, uh, which we, he'll introduce himself a little bit later on. But Bond heads in Harlem? <laughs> Bond heads into the Filet of Soul, uh, and he's the only white guy there. Uh, <laughs> uh, Roman notes, he sticks out like a white farm. <laughs> <laughs> I like that they charge him extra for no ice for his bourbon, <laughs> which he doesn't even get to drink. Because he just because he sits down at a booth and the booth just swings round. It's just like it's like a Scooby Doo movie all of a sudden. Right. And, and that when Seth does that, we're in the lair of Mister Big. Um, we're also introduced to the main girl that we've seen earlier, Solitaire. He introduces himself. My name's Bond. Takes a moment to look around. James Bond. I like how he does that. It kind of makes the breathing pause make sense instead of why would he uh Looking around are you, are you ready i'm gonna fucking do it are you ready Here yeah go. my name's bond i'm gonna kill you i'm gonna kill you <laughs> james bond uh, <laughs> i forgot to say my name's james let's talk about solitaire because this is where we really get to see more about her and the book she's apparently named simone luttrell and solitaire is just her nickname they don't bother with that in the story here they're just like that's ah, solitaire whatever She's a tarot card reader with psychic powers, because we're we're going there. <laughs> psychic powers are real in this universe. Yep. <laughs> she can predict, she can accurately predict the future through the tarot cards. Uh, she's played by Jane Seymour. Jane Seymour, beautiful woman. Gorgeous. Absolutely. She's the, she's the first person out of this movie that I I know of outside of mm-hmm. the Bond universe, really. Yeah, and she, I mean, there is a lot of striking women in this franchise. It's kind of one of the main appeals. Jane Seymour still looks good. <laughs> she's like 80 she's, or something. And it's like, wow, she's, she's better looking than a lot of like 20 year olds. She's 70. Right? She, actually, yeah, I'd say she's 70, right? Now. 70, okay. But, uh, but yes, but yeah, she, she does look great. So, but the only thing that's like destroyed the is that, hey, you got your tits out in wedding crashes. That's like. <laughs> <laughs> And Wedding Crashers was like, I don't know, 15 years ago? 20 years ago or something? So it's like, even then, she was playing like the, I don't know, gilf character kind of thing. And you're like, there's Dr. Quinn, medicine woman. All right. You know? Um, Yeah, so beautiful, beautiful woman. Uh, I mentioned before, they were thinking about um, casting Diana Ross. We'll get into more thing about that a little bit later on. Um, I love how her cards have a little 007 pattern on it. It's a neat little detail. I didn't catch that the first time that I had seen the film years and years ago. I eventually, like, it took a couple viewings for me to go like, oh, look at that, 007 on the background. Yeah, I didn't see that. Uh, At some points in the movie, I don't know exactly when, she's dubbed by, you guessed it, Willard White. (laughs) (laughs) Nikki Vanderzell again dubs her. Not Not for the whole movie, just parts of it. I don't know why. I'm glad she's getting more work. Yeah, she's just she's, she's the star of this franchise. She's in more uh, Bond films than some of the Bonds. <laughs> it seems kind of crazy. She plays more characters than basically anybody. Oh yeah, it's, it's just a... easily plays more than anybody else. Um, 
So Bond picks a card. He picks the fool, and she says, "You found yourself." I like that. It's nice. Funny. We're also introduced to the main henchman, Tihi. So awesome. <laughs> Why is he named Tihi? <laughs> He's smiling all the time. Yeah, he's always Tee-hee. laughing. <laughs> it's just you couldn't have thought of a more menacing uh kind of name. Tee-hee. 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 Yeah. Because the name is the name is stupid, but that claw. Yeah. That claw hand is just <laughs> that's that's an iconic look. It's it's a right. horrible prosthetic piece, but it's it's great. It's, it's horribly inefficient. Yeah. You find out, but you know, it's the like, yeah, it's 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 a cool visual. They could have done a better job hiding his hand in it instead of having him clearly have his hand sticking further out and, you know, it's longer than the rest of his arm and everything, but I like that he grabs the uh, Bond's gun, bends it, and Bond's just like, all right, I guess I'll toss this in the trash, <laughs> you know? It's kind of pointless now. I like Tee. Yeah, yeah, he was really good, and then I just like, afterwards, we they open the, the door opens up and Mr. Big just walks out. He just sees the scenes going on and says, yeah, go fuck him up or something. Or go kill, just go kill Bond and just walks back in. Yeah, Bond tries to introduce himself. He's, you know, doing his whole spiel. My name's Bond. It names this for Tombstones, baby. Y'all take this honky out and waste him now. I love how Bond says, uh, waste him. Is that, is that a good thing? <laughs> <laughs> totally like that proper uh, kind of thing. I don't, I don't speak your lingo. That's yeah. Your... <laughs> honky, huh? <laughs> yeah. Help me get with it, Jack. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, before they drag him off, Bond draws under the card, and it's the lovers, the drawing of both of them. And he's just this, like, uh, you know, d- don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. <laughs> to, to fuck you. <laughs> no, no, don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. <laughs> we'll talk more about this later. But yeah, oh, this happens. comes up in a horrible way later on. <laughs> uh, Bond gets away from the goons. He meets Harry Strutter, the CIA agent who was telling him, who points out, you know, you're sticking out like a sore thumb and all that. Um, they get into his car and Felix talks out of a microphone. That's the car's lighter. And Bond has another great line, a genuine Felix lighter. How illuminating. <laughs> that, one, that, one, that one was a little bit much for me. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's pretty good. It's not going to be the best Felix lighter pun we're going to get in the series. That's terrible. I'm actually quite hopeful for it. Uh, the other one's fucking bitching. <laughs> it's great. I love it. Um, so the next scene starts. Ha 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 ha. Fucking Baron Samurai, just, you know, the god of the cemeteries and the chief of the Legion of the Dead who cannot die. Working a dinner theater act. <laughs> it's some guy. Yeah, this was. This was like racist <laughs> that's all i can really say about it. he pops up here and there throughout the film largely in spots where he doesn't really do anything but like steal the show and chew the scenery with the snazzy get up or his awesome laugh or he's playing a flute or whatever it's a weird fucking character yeah i have no idea really what to say about him really because yeah he does he's a very charismatic character character he's awesome really steal a lot of the scenes that he's in but he really doesn't do anything. Mm-mm. He's like the biggest takeaway from this film. And if you were to say to somebody, what does Baron Samurai do in Live and Let Die? People are like, ah, oh, he's great. He's got the hat and Love he doesn't Love. die. <laughs> People are like, yeah, but what does he do? Now nah, he, he, uh, he laughs. <laughs> it's like, he's fucking awesome though. Like he's one of the coolest uh, henchmen, even though he doesn't really contribute much. I like him. Uh, Bond's uh, going to his hotel room, and Mrs. Bond has been expecting him. Bond really kind of plays this off as nothing. By the next scene, he's just scoping out the room, checking out the equipment. Because um, he's just like, I'm gonna fuck. Don't know who yet. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Bond, huh? All right. Well, I'm gonna draw that lover's card again. I don't really dig the uh, the the gadget as much when he's checking for things and he's doing that little the it, it kind of looks like it's a cross between like a pager and uh, some kind of an old um like Morse code type thing. Right. I don't really like that little gadget. It's like kind of my least favorite. It, it seems functional, but at the same time, it's just kind of weird. He's just like you know, click 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 click. Um. He scopes out. He sees that the the little button in the uh, 
in the bed uh, headboard or whatever is clearly a bug and whatever. Um, he's taking a bath because we're going to just, you know, see Bond taking a bath. Uh, he's more of a shower guy, I would think. And somebody lets a snake in the bathroom, which he dispatches in glorious fashion using aftershave and a lit cigar <laughs> with a flamethrower. Pretty cool. Yeah, that, 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 I mean, yeah, that was something. It's uh, <laughs> some barbecue snake right there. Yeah. But... yeah. I think he the was... most the most uh, chilling and disturbing thing about this entire thing is uh, Bond shaving in the bathtub. Yeah, it's a little weird, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not like there's a sink or anything. You would think... He doesn't uh... shave all the way. But yeah, yeah, he comes out and he's completely clean shaven. Yeah. Well, he's basically, like, he is really into that close shave because he barely has any stubble on him whatsoever and he's still just shaving his whole face. Mm -hmm. Gotta keep it, like, as uh, smooth as uh, possible. Before he kills the uh, snake, we're introduced to another henchman, Whisper, that we had seen in the Pentmobile. I love Whisper. Yeah, he's in it for a while. He's just like, he doesn't really say, or, or he doesn't say much because <laughs> when he does speak, he doesn't say very much because he's Whisper. So. Shall I open it? Shall what? I open it? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> he's, uh, he's like a teddy bear. I love Whisper. Mm. Yeah. I'm glad he doesn't die. Well, he kind of does. Uh, he does. It's implied that he probably is going to die, but you don't see him die. So I don't know. Maybe he pulls a Baron Samadhi. No, he's just he's just trapped inside a missile. Yeah. Actually, they just take him to take him away from there. They lock him up somewhere, still inside the missile. Shoot him off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's not like he can yell, "Hey, I'm in a uh, locked up missile," because he'd be like, "Hey, I'm in a locked up missile." <laughs> <laughs> Shall you open it? <laughs> <laughs> We're also introduced to Mrs. Bond, Rosie Carver. She's an agent working for Felix, and she says that uh, she's um, only his second mission, or he's only her second mission. The first one was Baines, the guy who was killed. <laughs> yeah. They're like, that's... Bond says, like, that's like, like reassuring to hear, and she seems to take that as if it's a genuine compliment. Mm. She also loses her wig and Bond's like, uh, you know, you, you should get your head together. <laughs> yeah. Go into the bathroom and she freaks out with the snake. She shrieks and Bond casually remarks, oh, I should have told you, you should never go in there without a mongoose. <laughs> what the <laughs> fuck kind of a line is that? <laughs> and then she's like freaking out. She's so upset to be part of this mission and stuff like that. She thinks she's going to be completely useless and all this other stuff. And then Bond decides this is the perfect opportunity to fuck. Yeah. Oh uh, well. It's like, oh, you are my wife. Like, but uh, after she says that she's going to be useless to him, he has the line, "I'm sure we'll be able to lick you into shape." Yep. Uh, you know, I mean, if she's Mrs. Bond, they should just catch up on old times. That's right. <laughs> I like that she says Felix told me there'd be moments like this. Oh, what a good old Felix suggests. Well, if all else fails, cyanide pills. <laughs> I settled for two bedrooms. <laughs> Good little moment, and she sees. Uh, she shrieks again, and there's a hat on her head, or on her head, uh, on her bed, with a bloody feather on it, and she's petrified. But Bond, ever so casually, just goes, "Oh, it's just a hat that belonged to a small-headed man with of limited means who lost a fight with a chicken." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if you look at uh, the reaction where she goes, "Don't leave me tonight." Oh, if you insist, it's almost like you put it there. So right. Like, like, yeah, okay, it. I'll fuck you. <laughs> okay, like, all right. If you insist, we'll sleep in the same room. You do, you do have to wonder, really, that, that considering what, already what's happened to Bond in this movie, where his drive has been shot in front of him and he's been locked away in a room and he's been like, led away to be killed and stuff like that and managed to escape, he doesn't really still seem to be taking any of these threats seriously. <laughs> No, he, like, as much as Connery is a more brutal kind of Bond in comparison, by the time you get, like, halfway through this film, you're like, oh, okay, I get it. Roger Moore's Bond is a complete sociopath. <laughs> like, he is dejected from humanity and just, he, he's psychotic. Yeah, this he dude is. just sort of like, oh, that guy died. Okay, I'm going to laugh. <laughs> kind of like... <laughs> At least Connery's Bond was, you know, uh, shocking, positively shocking. He kind of pops himself a little bit, but he he reacts to things 
a little more, you know. Pussy Galore, he's just like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. Like, your name's Pussy Galore? Whereas Moore would be like, of course you are, darling. Like, you know, kind of like... <laughs> Not gonna... <laughs> Speaking of which, <laughs> let's test this theory out, you know? Uh, uh, next morning, Bond goes get, to get a boat, and he picks the sleeping guy at the docks. Uh, Rosie goes to get changed. There's that part that Rob was <laughs> mentioning. You know, me, close off. Where? <laughs> the, guy, <laughs> the guy acts like he's just a mute or, you know, deaf and dumb or whatever you would want to call it back in the time. Uh, she notices, though, that there's this, like, this equipment and this gun. There's this ominous moment where he seems like he's going to, like, strangle Bond with this, uh, this rope and everything. So she points the gun at him. Turns out it's an ally. And not just any ally. It's Quarrel Jr., I like it. I remember when I said Quarrel was going to pop up, but not really. <laughs> yep. Because uh, in the books, this came before Dr. No. So it was actually Quarrel because he's not dead. <laughs> ah. And they're like, fuck. He's got a son. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, he's got a son who's maybe like the same the age. Hit, the real kid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is supposedly like maybe a few years after Connery's so. Yeah, this is where you get full into the okay, continuity is thrown out kind of thing because Connery, you can follow it. You you lose it at On Her Majesty's Secret Service, but you've got still some of the characters, like Moneypenny's still the same and, you know, whatever, so it's just kind of weird. Diamonds are forever, you just kind of act like, you know, whatever, just do some shit. And then with this one, you're like, Quarrel Jr. is the same age as Quarrel? Okay. It's weird. Yeah, if it was his brother or something, that'd be fine. But it's mm-hmm. just like the fact that it's supposedly his son. Yeah. It's weird. Rosie's a fucking twit, though, isn't she? She didn't even take the safety off the gun. I'm sorry, I could have shot you. Oh, you might have even killed me if you took the safety off. She's about yeah. as bad of an actress as her character is incompetent. Yeah. I, I was not feeling this performance. She's one of my least favorite ones, yeah. I mean... I appreciate when you find out what her role actually is, because before that, if you actually think that she's meant to be a serious ally to Bond, then you just go, oh, my God. But then then you figure it out later on. It's like, oh, OK, so but she's just an incompetent person in general. Yeah, she's working for Kananga. And. Um, oh, uh, before I forget, uh, Solitaire and Rosie Carver's races. Uh, remember I said before Diana Ross was one that they were thinking about doing for Solitaire. They swapped races. Rosie was supposed to be white. And the reason why they did that was um, some markets were so against interracial couples that they literally refused to show the scenes of Bond and Rosie, like wow. the love scenes. They were just like cut it out of the movie, just awful. So they were like, well, we got to make solitaire uh, somebody who's not black. Otherwise, we won't be able to show that in the, you know, some markets. I think Japan might have been one of them. Maybe not. Um, I think I was actually a lot of the ones that were in like the uh like the markets like J- jamaica or something i think might have been one of them which is just like that doesn't make any sense but yeah well but it's, it, it's 73 it's still like terrible we're very yeah. tentative about things like that yes it is terrible but i'm trying to yeah understand why like i mean, uh, I mean it is especially weird that it's just like this entire crew of black people and there's just the one white woman in the middle of it yeah, it's like that is just like it's an odd visual. Uh, Bond has a good little uh, asshole line here where he says, "Beautiful, brave, and now resourceful, Rosie, you seem to be staging a remarkable comeback." <laughs> <laughs> Great. It's like, oh, you're a fucking idiot, but you know, this is not bad, you know. Uh, Solitaire draws the lover's card again. She lies to Kananga, telling him it's a death card. So we're getting, you know, the baby face turn for Solitaire there. Um, I don't understand why. Because she's just like. The lover's card. I'm gonna fuck him. I don't know what to do here, you know. Yes, fuck. All right. Like, <laughs> God, they they could have done so much better with this. We'll talk about it. I'm still waiting. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're just still gotta get to the terrible part of that. <laughs> You're right. But Bond's fully on to Rosie lying to him about where Baines is killed. Uh, you know, oh, it's over there. I thought you said that he was killed up, uh, up in the hills, up in the hills over there. How about we do a picnic? <laughs> kind of thing say fuck again he wants answers and she's like oh, they'll kill me if i do and he just points yeah, his gun I'll kill you. <laughs> yeah i'll kill you if you don't oh this is this line is so good 
<laughs> the part that, that, that she's saying is, uh, oh, you, you wouldn't kill me after what we just did. Yeah, I wouldn't well, I certainly wouldn't have done it before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wouldn't have killed you so before. That's such a good Bond line. It's so fucking great. That might have been like peak Bond right here. That's if there's like a a Bond line in this, that might be the Bond line, you know? Yeah. So she notices this little scarecrow type thing's been spying on her, so she knows she's fucked. Because at this point, Kananga sees that she's either going to reveal it or get killed by Bond. And she tries to run off. She's killed by another little scarecrow drone with a gun in its mouth. Kind of weird. It, but I was like, okay, good. Yeah. Like, this, is, <laughs> this is not an effective character. It's, it's good to get rid of Rosie at that point. <laughs> Uh, Kananga calls out Solitaire in the death card and she tries to play it off. She's like, it must have been Rosie's death. Uh, if you don't ask specific questions, I can't be responsible for your misinterpretation of the answers. You know? Lying bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Just turns it on him, you know. Oh, yeah, I can't talk to you when you're talking to me like this kind of a thing. And then, and then he basically infers the fact that he killed her mother when she lost her own powers. And that he fucked her. Maybe. Because yeah. he's like, that's what makes you lose your powers. And, you know, if I, uh, if you, I want you to lose your power, I'm going to be the one who decides when to take it and I'll take I it. Mean, mm. I mean, I mean, just based on, again, don't want to go too far into it, but based on what Solitaire looks like and what Kananga looks like, I think it's very unlikely that he fucked her. Oh, you mean that they're like, well, the fact that she's completely white and he's black, it's probably unlikely that he that he's the fa- her father or something like that. Oh, no, I didn't well, think that no, there was no, supposed no, to be... No, because he did say he was going to fuck her. Later yeah. Movie. Oh, okay. No, I did assume he... that... Uh... Yeah, he did. I, I mean, yeah, I guess that means that he probably wouldn't be the one that... Uh, I don't know. Maybe he is the one that... Well, he no- well he, if he knows that that's the thing that's the issue, yeah. maybe he knows that because of what happened to her mother beforehand. Because I assume he worked with her or he, he had her captive... And then she gave birth to someone else, and then she she lost her powers. Which I thought was pretty weird that he waited like nine months until yeah. afterwards to like, oh, okay, then she's gonna die now after that. I mean, he's not that old too. Yafakoto is, I think, thirty three when they made this, so mm. he shouldn't. It, it, I guess maybe more so he's found out about this, and right. this is completely unrelated to him with. Uh, her mom or something i don't know it's kind of weird because th- really he shouldn't be that young he should be a lot older to make this work but um so i i don't like that uh <laughs> i don't like the idea that for instance that we've got psychic powers but i also think it's kind of funny and weird and strange that it's like you're gonna lose the powers when you're not a virgin anymore and i'll fuck you i'll be the one that you know it's just uh this is weird, isn't it? <laughs> a little bit. Uh, Bond casually smoking a cigar, hang gliding. Yep. <laughs> Why not? It's the thing. Um, then we get to the really skeevy moment. Yeah. Uh, Bond talks about how Solitaire really believes in the cards, doesn't she? You know, you do believe. Pick a card. And she picks the lover's card. So she's just resigned herself at this point. I drew the lover's card twice before. I drew it again. We're destined to have sex. And he's like, yep, so uh, let's uh, see about let's uh, that. And <laughs> she looks scared as all hell. But she goes along with it because the card said it. And Bond shows he's rigged the fucking deck. They're all the same yeah. card. Yeah. What a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, this is... I mean, this is seduction by future telly, essentially. So basically, she, it's not like she loves Bond or she cares about him or she knows anything about him at this point. Right. Other than the fact that she's drawn a card which says lovers to him. And so she's basically, well, the future tells me that I'm going to fuck you. So let's just go on and do it. There's no, and then, and Bond, like you say, he stacks the deck in his <laughs> favor to get this done. This is. I've got. I, I don't know to do, but call it like this is rape, essentially. See, this is this. Is, I mean, she consents to it, but she consents to it on the yeah. pr- premises. It's you know what though. This, if you were gonna just have Bond fuck this girl and rush that, I've seen movies in this franchise already where 
they try to just rush right through it. At least here, they're literally just going, all right, we're going to skip here, and here's why, because you stack the deck. <laughs> Moving on. I will I say, this is... many cards. Yeah, he must have just bought a, like 100 decks of the same thing to get the same card. I do think, though, this is a little bit easier to stomach than the Pussy Galore thing, because he's literally pinning her down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But yeah, that, 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 yeah, that, was that is far more like aggressively like okay, I'm against this. This is purely it. manipulation, and it's it's got a real rape victim psychological trauma vibe to it, especially when we afterward. Because if you cut it and you don't do the scene afterward, this isn't all that bad overall. Because it's like, but well, you... she drew the card first without any kind of manipulation. She drew the card a second time without any manipulation. He manipulates her, but hey, he manipulates a lot of people. But when you get to the post-sex mm. thing, she's devastated by this. She's yeah. lost her power and Bond's like, ah, come on, it's not that bad. Don't be all upset. And she's like, it makes no difference. A physical violation cannot be undone. Yeesh. That yeah, makes so it seem so, ah, like, you know? Yeah, so he, so this is the thing, that he's fucked the future telling out of her. Yeah. <laughs> so she can't, she can't do that anymore. So she's basically worthless to Kananga now mm -hmm. because he can't predict the future. And then there's even the thing where he's talking to her afterwards. He says, like, um, if we try and escape, they'll kill you. Yeah. And he'll say, kill us. Just like, you just fucked the... You, the reason why he's going to kill her is because you fucked her. You <laughs> fucked her entire life up. Well, like, he's like, you know, would... I was going to say I'd fuck your brains out, but I'm just going to fuck it. <laughs> Just, it's just it's just ridiculous it's the idea that he's manipulated her into bed cost her her unique special powers and then he's basically threatening her to say well you we better leave otherwise they're gonna uh. kill you now just like yeah of course they're gonna kill me because you fucked me that's <laughs> <laughs> you know what though and for and five seconds no sorry i need that sorry I'll, 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 afterwards five seconds later she's like Oh, should we have another lesson then? Yeah. Fuck his fucking magic penis. I hate him. <laughs> so lesson number one, there are no secrets. Lesson number two is that they're together till death do with parts uh, or somewhere abouts. And she's totally come around to the sex in that time. Yeah. Is there any time for lesson number three? And Bond's like, well, there's no use going off half cocked. <laughs> <laughs> no. The Callum... That's it. The podcast series is over. <laughs> fuck his magic penis, I hear. But that's the point. You gotta fuck his magic penis. <laughs> Even if you hate it. So, it's this point... penis just rid, rid someone of the powers. It's like, she had gone defective or something like that, because... But it's just like, no, it's just like... He, he manipulates her. He even says to her that he yeah. manipulated the cards for it to happen. It's like, okay, well, you wanna fuck again? Just like, yeah, <laughs> just... The whole rest of the movie, too, she's just like, can we have sex again? Because, <laughs> like, I mean, I we refer I to it as Bond's magic penis, but at this point, he's literally turned a lesbian and taken magical powers away from somebody. It's a magic penis. <laughs> it is literally a magic penis. Yeah, it's, just, it's so <laughs> skeevy with the fact that, like, obviously, we're holding around, just like the fact that he's taken this girl's virginity as well is just like. Like that's that's rich, really, for that sort of thing. It's just like it's just <laughs> not good at all. The fact that Moore's probably about twenty years older than her, her at this point as well. He's already. I mean, he's gonna get a lot a lot worse in the future mm. movies, but still. Once we get the BB doll. <laughs> so like, he's so nonplussed about it. He doesn't care that he's like basically given her a death sentence if things go wrong. So he's Roger like, Moore oh, was born nineteen twenty seven. And Jane Seymour was born 1951. So over 20 years older than she is. Yeah. And it's just, but just, it's just that as well. It's just like, like okay, I've just given you a complete death de de sentence, but hey, I got my dick wet. So that's, uh, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it all works out in the end. He's like, you want to draw another card? <laughs> so they head off. Uh, it takes a while to get to the next really big plot point of any interest for me to have written anything down. Uh, this part of the film kind of drags in my mind. The only note that I have down is that Solitaire's response to where they uh, want to go is anywhere that they can find a bed. <laughs> anywhere you can find one of these. It's like, more sex! Give me that magic penis. And we get the um, return of the cab driver. You know, hey, Jim! 
kind of guy. Uh, fucking love that guy. He's great. He's, he's back now. <laughs> Are we completely skipping over the chase and the, du- the double-decker bus? Uh... No, I think that comes later, doesn't it? No, the, the cab driver. Oh, wait, no, I think I might have skipped that, yeah. So, yeah, none of the stuff where they're going through the poppy fields, obviously we find out that they're the whole premise of this entire thing is that Kanang is a heroin de- dealer. Or, like, he's he's part of the heroin industry. So but we skip over that side of things. They get shot at by a helicopter at one point, but that's, like, nothing, really. Just another day in the office, really. But then they get in this double-decker bus, and, I mean, the most, again... It's a movie full of just completely unbelievable things. But one of the top, right at the top of that list, is Bond being able to jackknife a double deck of bus <laughs> to completely turn it 180 degrees in one fluid motion and use it to knock every single person on that were chasing him on motorbikes and cars off the side of the road and stuff. And then he goes under a low bridge and loses the entire top half of it. It's like, this feels, it feels like something that you would see in a, like a British fast movie of the 1970s or 80s. Like, oh, oh my God, low bridge ahead. And then they just yeah. like, like they, they come through the other side and someone's hat has gone off or something like that. It's just like... With that whoop? Kind of... Yeah, exactly. It's just, that, that is very much of the time for these really farcical Brit- British things like the Benny Hills and stuff like that. It's just right out of that playbook and just fitted into a Bond movie. And they really liked chase sequences in this film, like you mentioned earlier. There's, you know, the the one in Harlem. There's the double decker bus. There's the fact that um, Solitaire pretends that she's been kidnapped by Bond. And she smacks um, with the, her handbag, and Bond's like trying to escape in a plane with Mrs. Bell, who's having flight lessons. Now, after Goldfinger, were you half assuming that this old woman's going to pull out a machine gun? <laughs> Not in this movie. And yeah, I mean, it could have it could have been literally anything at this point. She could have jumped out the top of it. They could have like ejected an ejector seat and send her flying out the top of it or something like that. I wouldn't have just wouldn't have batted an eyelid out of it. <laughs> but I'm more concerned about just again the build up to this, where they're in this. So he's already like fucked over these people constantly and stuff like that. But they decide, okay, we're not just going to shoot you. We're going to put you in the back of a plane and throw you out of it. That's essentially what their plan was. He's going to go skydiving. And then yeah. he manages to get out of it. And then by the time he like he punches a few people and he manages to get under under the plane. And then we cut away to the camera and he's already halfway down the hangar. <laughs> In literally a second, he's managed to go from the side of the plane to almost at the completely other end of the runway. <laughs> so, I feel like you don't believe in James Bond. <laughs> His I magic penis did it. The, a 40-something-year-old... <laughs> Yeah, the magic penis can't help you here. There's like a third <laughs> leg. Like, yeah, how do, well, how do you know? <laughs> he's he's got uh he's got skills. <laughs> but but Mrs. Bell is hilarious. She has the she's first curse of the series. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's that's a great line. It's just also the fact that like he severs the plane wings going forward as well. It's just the fact that he he's taking off in a plane and he uses that to do a car chase with a plane. <laughs> Because it doesn't take off at all. Yeah. I like the little bit, too, afterward, where Felix is talking to Mr. Bleaker. And he's like, uh, okay, Mr. Bleaker, yeah, uh, I'm sure you're a, a veteran. <laughs> and then he's so, so like, um, he then says that uh, she ended up in intensive care after this. Yeah. Like, Fucking hell, Bond. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe he fucked her, I don't know. <laughs> So it just promises to go over there, use his magic penis, revive her straight away afterwards. Yeah. So Strider's killed during another replica of the funeral parade, and I really like that they don't need to show it to you because we've seen the setup. So we know that once that guy smiles, that we know what's going to happen. And you hear the music playing, and you're like, "There goes Strutter." See you, Harry. I really like that. Go, the the go marching in. Yeah. <laughs> so what was the point of this guy? To get killed and to show that not every black person in the movie is a bad guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah but it's just like, it's just, he appears in one scene with Bond as like a guy that helps him get out of that one situation. Well, although Bond had already gotten out of the situation, he was essentially just messing with him by holding him at gunpoint. Yeah. And then, and then he just dies here. It's just, okay. <laughs> like, I guess they had to, that was the reason that Bond ended up being there. Because then they do this another hilarious thing where they're right back in the the fillet of soul, and Bond says, "Oh, I know what happens if you sit in a booth. That's the <laughs> problem there." And so he goes sit at the right at the front of the stage. Felix gets taken away for a little bit, 
uh, there's a woman who's performing the uh, Live and Let Die theme much better than the actual. Um, uh, That's Paul probably what we would have gotten with the original intention of it. Yeah. 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 And and then his seat just falls down into an eject <laughs> into a, a trap door. Because <laughs> why like, not? <laughs> Again, it's just a comedy movie. Just like, like, like that is something. If it happened in an Austin Powers movie, I wouldn't bat an eyelid. Right. Just like saying, "Oh, I, I know what your tricks up to here," and you just like go somewhere else, and then it, and again, it's another trap. That's so. But this is an actual Bond movie. <laughs> this is the in the series of Bond movies, and it's just doing this bullshit. It's great. Kind of makes you wonder: Is every seat rigged <laughs> in some fashion, just in case? I mean, I mean, Bond is afraid it. to sit down in his own home. Bond just stands and he's like, you know what? I'm not sitting here at all. And then when he stands, like a fan pops up and pushes him to the ceiling or whatever. Or uh, he sees right through the disguise of Mr. Big. And I mean, to be fair, how oh, could he? These arm restraints. They're not even holding his arm. No, they're not. Yeah, I saw so that as well. <laughs> yeah. We got to talk about how bad the prosthetic is for Mr. Big. He is the same except shiny and that his mouth can't move. It's awful. Yeah, it's it's not the greatest, but I guess he had to do some sort of. Uh, maybe the technology wasn't there at the time to do some really good prophetic prosthetic work. Yeah. At this point in the commentary, Yafikoto was talking about how he got really into. He always saw himself as potentially being able to be James Bond, so he was like, "Oh, I get to be you know a Bond villain. That's pretty cool." But he got used to the idea of. The, like the catering type stuff that they did to the actors in this. So he just decided he was going to try to live like Bond. And he got so used to the lifestyle. He was only eating at certain restaurants and going to certain hotels. He had this moment of clarity like three years after the movie where he's like, oh my God, I got to stop trying to be Bond. <laughs> like, this is ridiculous. I can't live a lifestyle like this. And he's like, nobody can be Bond. This is a- absurd. Um, I like Yafit Koto a lot. I, it's ridiculous and on all that, but I actually like Kananga as like a Bond villain. I I thought he was exceptional as a Bond villain. I think the 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 poise, the charisma, the like the way that he spoke, everything like that was just so befitting of a Bond movie villain. Where you know at the end of the day he's not going to get the job done, yeah. but he oozes that sort of swagger and confidence and conviction that really I thought I thought he's up there with like the top bottom villain so far Mm -hmm. me too how you feeling about him Rob he was a very fun villain I like that when he's explaining himself he has he just seems so sure of himself like he almost matches Bond in that regard but this scene I was immediately like, fuck all of this. Prosthetics look like shit. The arm restraints aren't holding him. I really wanted him to just be like, oh, no, I'm not even being held down here. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't well, know. I mean, I like the plan. Yeah. So his plan is that he's going to give away two tons of heroin for free in order to basically increase the addict. And to basically cut off all the other supplies in the... Uh, in the area and to increase the attic rate about twice over. Yeah, he's so going to like he... flood the market for free and yeah. the mobsters are basically going to go out of business because they're getting shit for free. So, you know. And then he's obviously got a huge resource of heroin that he's growing right now. So it's just a case of once everyone else is out of business, he's alone in the thing, then he's going to start and he's got so many more addicts to sell to, then he's going to start selling and it's going to become even more rich for him. It's a good plot. It's a good plan. It's a good plot. And it's something that I wouldn't think a diplomat would worry himself with, but cool. Yeah. So, so, uh, uh, basically Kananga gets uh, the watch off Bond. Well, he doesn't, uh, tea he he has to do. (laughs) Which, uh, uh, Bond, uh, he, when he's trying to do this, uh, tea, uh, the actor, I'm blanking on his name. Uh, he couldn't get it on the first thing. This was not planned at all. He just struggled with it. And Roger Moore is the one who ad libbed the line "Butterhook," and apparently he just called him that for the whole rest of the time that they were filming. He'd just be like, "Oh, hey, Butterhook, come over here." <laughs> you know? I like it's that a little bit. Line. It's a good ad. Li- it's, it's, if it's ad libbed, then that's great. Yeah. So credit to Roger Moore for that one. That wasn't written in the script. 
But uh, Kananga is going to test Solitaire's powers. Uh, if she gets the question wrong, Teehee's going to snip off Bond's pinky and then move to other more sensitive areas. And um, Callum was cheering for it at this point. <laughs> we might as well frame it at this point. I mean, Callum's like in the museum or something. Well, when we get to another, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> would imagine that it's just like, well, by the time we get to, uh, I don't know, um, Living the Die here. No, not Living the Die, we are on that one. <laughs> Living Daylights. <laughs> uh, she gets it wrong. But he doesn't have Teehee snip off the pinky. Oh. So he was he was teasing a little bit. Because I, I watched it for the first time, obviously not knowing what's going to happen afterwards. And I just go, because he claims that she got it right. Or at least like figures out, seems to suggest that she got it right because he gives Bond his watch back and everything and lets him go for a little while. But I'm just thinking, okay, so you let... So your big ploy to figure out whether that she is telling the truth and she can still see the future or not is to ask her one 50 question. Yeah. <laughs> yes or no. But then he and... does the whole thing of like, I gave you every chance. You had a 50-50 shot and you got it wrong. So they knock out Bond because... You know, he's just sort of like, oh, well, she's got her power, so I guess I'll fuck off. Ow. You know? <laughs> and then and then Solitaire's B excuse is the cards made her fuck him. Yeah. The cards did well, it. Well, they, they... I mean, they did, yeah. They did. I mean, to be fair, he, he, him and the cards made her fuck him. Yeah. He... This was the most... Okay, so the slapping women throughout this series has been uncomfortable, but this was the most overdramatic, like, wind-up for a snack here that I why is this movie such a comedy <laughs> at least it's not Bond smacking her right yeah at least he's a villain at least I'm supposed to hate him for knocking her down yeah but like he he does this ridiculous wind up thing like he, oh yeah it's, it is completely over the top but and then you have just Sam Adi makes his one of his cameos yeah. in the background just holding a death card up just like ha 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 I'm here uh <laughs> Bond gets knocked out. They say, see you later, alligator. Oh, by the way, Callum, that was at the point where he says, you know, when the time came, I would have given, I basically saying I would have fucked you when the time yeah. came. Like, oh, uh, why'd you fuck Bond? I would have fucked you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah see, that's what it seemed like. Like, yo, I was, I was <laughs> supposed to do that. <laughs> He's like, no, that's mine. <laughs> Give him the watch. I don't even want it. Yeah. No. By Taker. I'm going to have a new solitaire with Blackjack. Okay. <laughs> a new solitaire. It's called Blackjack. And she's a hooker. <laughs> no, you've already got a hook. He's got two school TV. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and then Whisker could be no like, whispers like, me. <laughs> Stand. So we're back in a while, Crocodile. And Bond refers to uh, the baby crocs as potential overnight bags. <laughs> um, Again, it's just it's just another one of these instances that's like just so atypical of the Bond franchise, where he's just like he gets led out into the water by um, T, who's giving him like some sort of encyclopedic guide to crocodiles and alligators. Like, he's this is the point where we learn about reptile yeah. biology. <laughs> Did you know that there are two ways of uh, disabling a crocodile? <laughs> I learned in this movie. <laughs> One way is to take a pencil and jam it into the pressure hole behind its eye. The other way is twice as simple. A pencil in his pocket. <laughs> yeah. He's, uh, you know, what's the other way? Whatever. Oh, it's it's twice as simple. You just put your hand in your mouth and pull out all their teeth. <laughs> So, so it was so, also revealed that Tihi, the reason why he has one robotic arm is because an alligator took his real arm off. Yeah. So like, uh, big Albert. Big at this Albert. point, I was confused by the random lesson we were getting here. I was like, wait, is he actually, is he just like, yeah, here, Bond, uh, the, yeah, you're good. Uh, look at our alligators. Uh, yeah, we, we've got parents too. And I'm thinking, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, well, see, there's a thing with this movie, which is really weird. It's more so with uh, Kananga than anybody else. But I don't know if you guys get this impression. I kind of feel like Kananga wants to be Bond's friend. <laughs> no, I think he wants to. I think he wants to appear as Bond's equal, and he wants to like show that he's like he's a civil 
because he, obviously he's a diplomat and stuff like that and stuff like that. So he does have that as his actual career because he's put the Mr. Big character on to do his misdeeds on the other side. So I guess he feels like he's a very civil and actual uh, gentleman villain. We do and get just another uh, and we do get another villain in the next film that even more so does this whole I want to be friends with Bond type of thing uh, to an even bigger level. But uh, I, I do kind of like think that it's kind of funny to think that it, a slightly altered version of the script. It's like, oh, dude, show Bond the Crocs. This is great. This is awesome. Yo, look at my look at my alligators. Isn't this in this neat <laughs> kind of thing? Like, again, well, again, it's just another situation where just fucking choose the guy. And yeah, then we're just gonna lead him out into the middle of a rog where he's surrounded by alligators and crocodiles. You know what it is? It's I, I forget the movie, but I had said that it's all these nerds. Like, oh man, this is so cool. That's kind of like Bond is like king nerd here, and they're just like, I want to impress him. I don't really want him to die. I just want him to <laughs> like me. I want Bond to be like, you are the coolest when he dies. <laughs> yeah. And then Bond escapes by running over the back of alligators. Uh, we can't skip past that. Uh, first, I really like the little bit where he uses his magnet watch and you think he's going to get the boat, uh, yeah. but it's yeah, tied right. up. So he's fucked because it's like you're thinking at that point, oh, he's going to just do that. And that's how he gets away. And they're like, nope, got to figure out another thing. And instead, he walks on a couple of crocodiles to the other side, wearing crocodile shoes, mind you, which was uh, an idea of Roger Moore's. <laughs> when have I got a crocodile, alligator shoes or whatever? Well, he's um, a sadistic bastard in real life. <laughs> yeah. So it's like he is a sociopath. It's... <laughs> now, the stunt man and the crocodile wrangler who did this stunt, for real, six times before he got it right. He was paid 60 grand and uh, the amount of times that the crocodiles gnawed on him, he ended up getting 193 stitches on his leg and face. So, so you see, for that amount of money, I'd drive you to a KKK cookout. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and instead, for that amount of money, jump on crocodiles six times. I can't believe that's real. It's fully oh, fucking just, real. I can't believe they made him run across <laughs> real crocodiles. They Who used the a rubber snake. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, they had a plastic snake earlier and stuff like that. So why did they think that this was the part they had to go super realistic? Yeah. <laughs> no, it has to be real crocodiles. We can't just have fake, like, create some fake crocodiles. It's not like fucking Jaws comes out prior to this or something like that. <laughs> it's... That's just one of those things. I don't know. Uh, the guy, by the way, is named Ross Kananga. That's where they got the inspiration of the name for the villain. Because the, he's right. named uh, Bonaparte something, whatever, in the book. And they just liked him so much that they're like, let's name the villain after him, whatever. Ross Kananga's father, eaten by alligators. <laughs> and the no. guy still has this as his job. <laughs> no, you're lying. I'm not fucking lying. <laughs> He's an alligator wrestler, wrangler, crocodile dude, or whatever. That's fucking and it's like, insane. dad got eaten by alligators. I guess I'm going to still do it. Yeah, I'll wow. jump on him six times. And you know what's even weirder? It only took him six times to get the part, uh, to get the stunt right. Guess how many times it took him to get the magnet zipper right? With the, with the dress. <laughs> uh, about 50 times. 29. No! It took him more to get the dress to get unzipped than the guy to walk on crocodiles. <laughs> I'm just, just probably away by this story of the, uh, his dad being eaten by alligators, and that's his job. It's like, it's like Robert Irwin opening a specific manta ray exhibit <laughs> or something like that. It's, it's insane, isn't it? You would never think that this was a real thing. And with all that stuff to go along with it, it just makes it so much better. And for him to just be like, I got paid 60 grand. I, I walked on crocodiles a couple times. 193 stitches on his leg and his face. Because it was, they got pissed. Like, the, you know, you, you're jumping on them. You don't say. <laughs> they got pissed. No. And they're just like, fuck you, dude. Stop jumping on us. We're going to. They're not Donkey Kong going, Tony. They're not right. Go, oh, and then go. But... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's insane. And. That's like, of course, arguably the biggest stunt of the whole film. You know, the thing that it's like, 
the biggest takeaway, but it leads to a boat chase, uh, which has that other insane type of things going on with it. In the script, all that was written was scene 156, the most terrific boat chase you've ever seen. That's it. So, so this is like really gets into Duke of Hazard territory, right? Mm. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because we meet Sheriff J. W. Pepper, a rootin' tootin' as southern as the day is long, cowboy hat sporting, tobacco chewing, out of shape, racist hell of a son of a gun. <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, it's something to do in 2021 where you get to watch some good old fashioned police brutality mm. <laughs> in the. Uh, where he just like decides to pull over the black guy, basically says, "Oh, that's a nice set of wheels you got. If they're yours, it's like oh, okay, that's gonna." <laughs> I'm <laughs> sure this ain't it. exactly your debut at this sort of thing. <laughs> Ten yep. fingers on the bed. Yeah. <laughs> Calling all the black characters boy and all this. Yeah, spitting on his hand when he's got his hands on the thing. Yeah, I, I'm so glad we're beyond those days. We're not in the series. Oh fuck! <laughs> not even in real life, if you really think. About yeah. It. <laughs> well, that's that. That was the joke, and then Tony totally said that in the series. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, this black George O'Call Bond at one point his his boat flies over, and one of the villains uh destroys his patrol car with the boat. Like that's, oh, that's the uh, the jump made the Guinness Book of World Records and stood for three years. Longest speedboat jump ever. Uh, one hundred and ten foot jump. Wow. Uh, so the cop cars crashed on the police radio has this thing afterward with jw pepper is done with that guy and it's uh hey uh there's this woman who's got this dog that's foaming at the mouth she's got it locked up in the shed and she wants to know if you'd like to come over and shoot it for her well, <laughs> what the you? fuck <laughs> again this is it's so i mean the, the actual context of it is just like scary in that regard but right. it's, like, it's still another just comedy thing it's just basically just saying like oh why don't you come down and do this really rudimentary thing when you're like this big tough sheriff and stuff like that he just like he goes and like requisitions another patrol car and then there's just so much more there's so much bullshit in this entire ch- chase it's ridiculous they could have cut this or one of the other things out. They could have. I, I think that obviously the the more important thing probably would have been to cut out the uh, double decker bus thing, mm. just kind of speed things along. But he That's he's funny. got a brother in law, Billy Bob. Of course, he's named Billy Bob. Who's got the fastest boat? Uh, <laughs> when they see the black guy, because uh, he uh, gets uh, taken out by one of the goons, the other cops are confused as fuck because it's like that's his brother in law. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, we have to talk about just slightly before that is when um like Bond's uh, the original speedboat, his engine starts to die because an errant bullet caught the uh, engine, and so he manages to pull up the boat on a country club essentially, <laughs> and then the villains overspeed it, and then they get trapped in a in the swimming pool of the country club, and Bond just steals another person's, just steals just a random person's speedboat and gets going again. I think in every single Roger Moore film, I don't know for sure. I know it's at least in this Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker. There is some kind of an action sequence of a chase where something happens where the public reacts to it. Like how this where they take out the cake and the bride cries. Oh yeah, that was it. That was even like that was yeah, that was even the bigger one. This Bond just decided just going to sigh for a wedding. At one point, just like get the boat off again, just goes overland, no problem to the rudder or the the engine rotor or anything like that. It just goes straight through the land, go through the middle of a wedding. Another villain crashes through the cake and crashes through a canopy, and the bride starts crying. It's just like, okay, am I literally watching a carry on film from the nineteen seventies? That's exactly what I'm feeling right now. Just like this is not serious. Why are you asking me to take this seriously? <laughs> Now, I'm not saying I want this to happen at my wedding later this year, <laughs> but... Callum, that's your job. You're the British one. You know, um, if one, if you want to um, get a speedboat and do that with the Live and Let Die soundtrack playing or something, at the very least, it'll be like, okay, it happens in real life. Yeah. I'm trying to think of a good pun that I could do at that point. <laughs> uh, so, uh, maybe like, um, since he bashes through the cake, it'd be like, well, somebody had to cut the cake. You know? Yeah, that's what I was thinking right now, but I was trying to see if I can make some sort of nautical thing. <laughs> I don't know any nautical type things. Um, 
there's a line here. Uh, eventually, the, the crash, uh, the sequence ends, and um, JW says, "What are you, some kind of a doomsday machine, boy?" I go, JW, this fellow's from London, England. He's a sort of secret agent. Secret agent on whose side? (laughs) (laughs) The fuck? I hate JW Pepper. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, but do we talk about how he disposed of the 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 uh, henchman that was trailing him? That the Bond somehow is quicker to throw a bucket of water in the guy's face (laughs) than that guy to pull a trigger on a shotgun. Yeah, (laughs) these movies. Uh, I really think, like, you need to start believing in Bond, Cal. <laughs> well, at least I know this at the very most. I know it was a Bond movie because the fucking boat goes up another bigger boat and blows up, so they had to get yeah. one explosion <laughs> in this entire movie. <laughs> then we're pretty much at the climax. Because it's just like, chase sequence, chase sequence, say, all right, let's get to the end of this kind of a thing. Uh, the Baron Samet uh, ritual with him rising out of the grave is really cool, I think. Uh, it's a statue. Bond shoots it, it explodes, you know. But I like that because the people are kind of like, oh, yeah, cool. Like Baron Samurai's uh, raised from the dead. And it's just this little mechanism. They're just, you know, totally getting um, the wool over their eyes. Yeah. It just, it's just uh, prior to that, Quarrel had been setting mines in the poppy fields and Bond was waiting for that to happen. He was just let, watching Solitaire with this man with the poisonous snake in front of her for <laughs> ages. Just like, yeah, I've just got to wait until the Bond goes off. Can't really. <laughs> Can't rush this too much at the moment. They so rescue her from getting bitten by that snake. The poppy fields are destroyed. And another Baron Samurai pops up. This time it's the real guy. And Bond fights with him with a machete for about three seconds. Knocks him into a coffin full of snake and he's dead. <laughs> he's just like... Ugh, uh, uh. <laughs> just like, this guy has done nothing this entire movie. <laughs> just laugh and... Like be charismatic, and then he just has one fight scene with Bond where he's blocked with the machete, punched in the gut, uppercutted into a trunk, a coffin full of snakes, <laughs> and then just rides around for ten seconds and dies. Just, and this, I, I've I've heard the name Baron Samadhi before I saw this movie, and I just think this is it. This is the guy <laughs> everyone talks about. Now Jeffrey Holder, the actor who plays Baron Samadai, he was like a a dance choreographer, like a real popular one, and I think it might have been Jamaica. Um, so he was never really like an actor. Actor, I don't know if that played into the fact that they would have given him like maybe they would have combined Whisper and Baron Samadai or something like that. But he's very much more a visual kind of thing instead of actually like a deep character for sure. It it goes to say something when you when I watch this and think, yeah, I would have been more threatened if Papa Shango was in this movie instead. <laughs> That's what Papa Shango is based off of. Yeah, that I didn't was see clear. why it failed. <laughs> 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 uh, so, what were you guys thinking at this point? Now that Baron Samadai is dead, just like, like you said, like you're just disappointed. Like, oh, that's it. Fucking like, can we end this already movie. at this point? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. like this. Uh, I, I thought Diamonds was going to be uh, right above Dr. No pretty much forever. I know. No, I did not like this film. I don't know. It just did not feel important. Like I said, it felt like a filler film, really, in this franchise. So uh, we get a little bit more action, blah, blah, blah. I, I love the moment where Bond's explaining the compressed air gun pellets and everything to Kananga. And Kananga shoots uh, the couch that Whispers on just for a laugh, and he's just like, "This is great! Like we're buds, we're you know we're, we're talking about our gadgets here. Look at this fucking Whisper, haha! <laughs> like you know, kind of thing." I he's love Kananga. Laughing. He's super excited about the gun and all that other stuff. And then and then he um uh I I do like the bit where it's like Felix is sitting with a quarrel on the boat trying to wait too do his get away and he says oh he must be tied up somewhere and then they immediately yeah. cuts to Roger Moore tied to <laughs> to uh to just a, a little crane thing and uh Kananga cuts Bond's arm he's planning on lowering him into the water with solitaire and that sharks are gonna eat them and I, I forget the line I didn't write it down but something about like um yeah you know, don't you need a deeper cut or something and he's like oh you those cuts are gonna find you to very be very fatal or whatever yeah, he says like, I find, you'll find those cuts to be very faithful, and he basically says something along the lines of, "I don't, I don't suppose you'll have enough time to drown." 
and he's about to go into the water. Yeah. Also, I just have to I just have to ask about this again because I I brought this up I think in um oh I'm trying to remember which movie it was it was uh before oh it was the one before uh tomorrow not no oh, well. again all my Bond movies mixed <laughs> up on the top of my head uh Thunderball yeah I believe it was Thunderball where um uh I oh, know it's the it's the one after Thunderball you only have twice <laughs> yeah you only have twice where um uh. Where the um, the femme fatale has him trapped in the plane and he just breaks through it because it's wood. Yeah. <laughs> just thinking, could you not have anything stronger than just plain old rope to tie him to the thing? <laughs> well, he gets out of it using the magnet watch, uh, which apparently has a little saw on it that we've never seen. Yeah, it's a spinning saw blade as well. So it's yeah. like everything is multifunctional. And you he ever gets... see the, uh, it's like a college humor sketch where it's revealed that all Batman villains were paid by Alfred <laughs> to make Bruce feel better about his life. Is that not what this feels like? Where everybody's just like, "Now nah, we're gonna make this easy on Bond because he's Bond and he's so cool. He's so cool." Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, Fuck. Well, yeah, but I'm also feeling like the sort of thing. It's sort of like, well, Bond, this uh, this uh, gadget is a pen, but it's also a gun, and it's also a flashlight, and it's also <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's also a sedative and it's also stuff like it's just like all this fucking stuff. It's just like this. So basically it just said, okay, so here's this watch that can basically do everything to get you out of every situation you find yourself in. But if M was looking at that, he would have been like, is that all it does? <laughs> <laughs> you asshole. I'm tired of playing these games. It's Where's my fucking spoon? <laughs> can you make coffee as well? Yeah. He also gets one of the uh, air bullets with magnet. That we use a little bit later on. And I like that when Bond escapes, Whisper can't yell out, look out, because he's Whisper. So he's just like, look out, <laughs> you know, a nice little touch. But Bond dispatches of Kananga by forcing the bullet into his mouth and Kananga inflates like a balloon, flies up to the ceiling and explodes. And Bond has the quip. He always ha did have an inflated opinion about himself. <laughs> it <laughs> is... One of the absolute, if not the worst, effects of the entire franchise. It's a fucking balloon. Out of a fucking window is bad. Yeah, th I mean, yeah, this is awful. I don't know if it still does. It still, for me, doesn't beat the bits in um, uh, you only live twice, where you just see like um, the uh, woman jumping out of the plane, and you can just see her just falling down with the plane in the background and stuff like that, <laughs> and some of the explosions. In the in the last movie as well were terrible and Diamonds of Forever are terrible, but yeah, this is just it's just an inflated doll going into <laughs> into the roof and just blowing up, and then you just see scattered bits of his body in the water. Just poof. it's, it's a, vivid, a, man. Nah. a hell of a way to go, you know. Like they're trying to figure out how do we write this film? Okay, well, what, what do we do to dispatch the main villain? How about he turns into a balloon, flies up to the ceiling, and pops? Like damn. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, uh, like Solitaire just says, like, "James, how do we get out of this situation?" He just says, "We'll take the train," because there's a little monorail thing yeah. there as well. And, just, and then it just cut, and then he's and he's on an actual train. Yeah. But okay, there's no like daring escape or anything like that. It's just like okay, we're just gone. Uh, Felix asks, uh, "What Bond and can and Solitaire can do on a train for 16 hours?" And Bond says, "Say goodbye to Felix, darling." <laughs> um. Solitaire, I don't know if this still holds up. I think it does. Is the only person to beat Bond in a game of cards. Well, that was her life. Yeah. She beats him at, uh, on the train. In Jin Rami. <laughs> and uh, Bond uh, is like, you know, huh, unlocking cards <laughs> kind of thing. And Teehee's on the train. And he flips Solitaire in the bed into the wall unit type thing in Q fight sequence. Not as good as From Russia With Love for my money, but still pretty entertaining. This is the best scene in the entire movie. This is the only scene that feels like a fucking Bond scene. <laughs> it, outside of obviously Bond just fucking everything that moves apart yeah. or anything like that. The, other, the only other thing that feels re realistically like a Bond thing is this fight scene because it's not like Moore isn't as coordinated or as physical as Connery is. But every every fight he has in this movie feels really really choreographed. But like he gets physical, he actually looks like he's angry in this fight scene, whereas the rest of them he's just been a bit either bewildered or not really caring at all. And then 
Tihi manages to like he, he's getting in choked up against the window and stuff like that, and there's breakages of the windows and all that other stuff. And Bond then just manages to find some wire cutters conveniently placed somewhere. Don't know where they came from. I think it was but, it's uh, uh like the makeup kit and whatever that she has oh, okay. or something, or okay, maybe it's maybe sense. it's his kit. And then uh, but uses it to cut a couple of wires, which locks his arm in place on a window. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really, that's does look a nice work of his own mechanics with his arm. He flips him out of the train. <laughs> yep, just hoofs him out of the train, just throws him over, and the arm's left there. <laughs> yeah. Just lets go of the arm. And then there's the line, Tony, I'll let you say it because you're the punk guy. Are we really going uh, all the way to that? Because uh, oh, note want, that I've got next is a uh, Bond flip Solitaire back. <laughs> oh, yeah, he, he flips Solitaire back, and Solitaire thinks that he was she, the yeah. Bond was the one that did it in the first place. <laughs> Yeah, she's just like, that wasn't funny, whatever. And he, he casually, you know, he, he tosses Teehee's arm away and he's like, oh, I'm just being disarming. <laughs> and then we just see a shot of Baron Samadhi sitting on the front yeah. of the train. He's he's alive. He's laughing. The fuck? <laughs> the end. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> Love it. I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't, I don't know what you want me. You want me to say about this movie anymore? I like we talked through the entire thing, but like, I just don't. I, we've, I've watched the entire thing. We've just spent the last like hour plus talking about it, and I still don't fucking know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very clear that this is just a cash cow right now. They don't know what the fuck they're doing. They're just like, we can throw anything at the wall and it'll stick because it's Bond. I have this. Like, I mean, I I've done my tier list before. I've seen these movies a million times. Um, as far as my rankings that I'm going here, it's my number three because it's just Bullshit. it's just a fun movie. I would rather watch Live and Let Die than to watch like uh, Doctor No on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Whatever. I'm not saying that it's like quality, <laughs> but I'm t- talking as far as like. Personal enjoyment from Russia with Love and Goldfinger are number one and number two because quality does factor in. But then, then Live and Let Die comes above like Thunderball for me. I'd rather watch Live and Let Die than Thunderball. That's insane. Very insane. <laughs> this was, this was like, it was too, it's, these movies are too long to be this disjointed. Like, I, I was very glad to see the credits roll here. Well, where are you? Like, where are you ranking it on your list? It's uh, it's below diamonds above Doctor No. Really, you like diamonds better? I uh, diamonds felt more like a Bond film. <laughs> I didn't think so at the time, and then you showed me this. <laughs> I like that we got a real uh, disparity going on here. I got it ranked higher. Rob's got it ranked lower, and Callum's in like the middle. Yeah, I have it uh, below Doctor No and above from Russia with Love on my thing. So it's currently fifth out of the eight that I've seen so far. It's terrible. It, like I say, it, like, it was it was it was an enjoyable watch. It's just it's, it's not bad shit crazy. <laughs> I don't I, yeah, I don't care what you say about this, and I know what we're gonna get for the rest of this franchise, especially with uh, more in it. But I'm just gonna feel like I'm gonna come out of this and thinking. Yeah, these aren't Bond movies. I mean, there are a very specific Bond movie. It's a Roger Moore Bond movie. Mm-hmm. And so that's a very, very different animal to basically any other thing we're going to see in this entire franchise. And I'm, I'd say I enjoyed watching it, and I'm going to enjoy the rest of the more journey just because I know it's going to be even more ridiculous than this. It does get more ridiculous, and that's why, and that's why I'm going to enjoy get some perverse pleasure out of it. But I don't even, I don't think actually we want to go on the ranking side of it. I can rank it high just because, even though I personally enjoy it, I can't shake away from the fact it's like, yeah, but. You know, I've seen parody movies that take it more seriously than this, really. <laughs> Just... Yeah, it's yeah. I, I I'm curious to see how the ranking of Live and Let Die goes when we're done with Roger Moore's films, because when you start getting more into the rhythm of the Moore stuff, then it becomes you almost have to rank the Roger Moore films as different movies compared to the other ones. Yeah. Like I imagine they'll all be towards the middle or bottom for me when we get to like license to kill i mean 
if this is more of an Austin Powers, License to Kill is lethal weapon without the comedy. Like, that was the first one that got PG-13 because they were like, we can't say that this is PG. Characters are dying in weird ways in this one. Like, that, you know, it's too brutal and stuff. Like, vastly different film than something like Eleven Let Die, which a lot of people more is their favorite because this is their favorite type of Bond. Like, the more... He's suave and sophisticated and charming and goofy. Moore isn't my favorite Bond. Uh, my favorite... Uh, Brosnan's not everybody's favorite Bond. I don't know. Because, like, I I think if you like the goofiness of Moore, you tend to like Brosnan better. If you think Moore is too goofy, but you like the charm and a little bit of the humor, Brosnan's probably your favorite Bond. If Connery, the come more cutthroat type of guy is there. You tend to like Connery and Craig and Dalton. It kind of seems like where people's mm. opinions tend to go. I mean, I do have to ask Bro about this. So, so based on what Tony has told us, and various, obviously we will get our own views. When we actually watch the movies, but you've got live and let die as like your second to last one. And this is arguably in many people's eyes, probably one of the best more movies. Are you concerned the doctor now won't be at the bottom? For very long. Oh, it's possible, especially with the way Tony talks about <laughs> Moonraker. Uh, I, I'm I'm just waiting for Octopussy because that is going. Because from what <laughs> I remember from that movie, that yeah. is going way down. I mean, it's very possible by the end of this, Doctor No is firmly in the middle of my list. And I I want you to try to keep in mind to the criticisms of all these going forward because it's hard because there's 25 fucking movies, but like. Try not to lose track of the fact that Dr. No was boring. And like the, you know, the way that they shot some of the stuff and that they had like, let's speed up the action for this kind of thing. Cause there's goofy elements of every single Bond film, except for pretty much like kind of golden eye and the Craig stuff and uh, license to kill. But like there's very goofy elements here and there. And we are firmly, once we got, to Diamonds Are Forever, we are firmly in the let's go for a laugh riot kind of thing for all the way up until The Living Daylights. Living Daylights is the next one that gets uh, where it's like, okay, let's start to get Bond back, I guess, in a little way. Yeah. I, I, actually, just um, when you were saying that, I just reminded, it just like compelled me to move, live in that die one up to number four in my rankings. Above Doctor No. Oh yeah, I see that you just did that because because yeah, remembering that it was kind of boring. I, I I I'm not as a much of a critic of Doctor No's like Rob and uh, you are in that regards, but I kind of feel like if I was going to watch one of these movies again, it probably would have been Living That Die. So mm-hmm. so so it gets a little bit of a bump up there. It's not going any higher than that. <laughs> I think that's the reason Doctor No is at my bottom, just because I don't think I would watch that movie again. There's some of these I definitely would. Maybe even live and let die. If it's an isolated incident away from this series that we're doing, where we're introducing ourselves to Bond and going through this, I, maybe I'd watch Live and Let Die again. But Doctor, no, I don't think I ever would. I, like I said, I'm very curious to see by the time, even by the time we get done with the Man with the Golden Gun, because there's some wacky shit with the Man with the Golden Gun. Uh, but you get like Spy Love Me, Moonraker, For Your Eyes Only, Octopus, You View to a Kill. By the time we're done all those more ones, I'm curious to see if everybody goes, man, Living That Die was great. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm sure we will. Um, I have certainly hope not. So let's talk about some of the other elements here. Uh, the gadgets. We've got the hotel room equipment. Not really big on that, but it's just a thing. I mean, I do enjoy that they've carried on the trend of Bond is always scoping out his hotel room. Yeah. I also, uh, also do love his uh, rudimentary method of using a grape to disable yeah. one of the buttons. <laughs> I enjoyed that. That's a uh, Bond and grapes. That's a, the second time out of three, I think, in the series where grapes factor. <laughs> it's just, um, do we count his coffee machine as a gadget? Maybe. I would. <laughs> Fucking M seems so pissed about it. Yeah. Right. For the time, it's like, wow, this is a complicated machine. It's making the espresso and whatever. Um, 
He's got his digital watch and his magnet watch. Digital watch at the time, everybody was like, oh, I got to have one of those. Um, I love the magnet watch. Absolutely love it. Yeah, that's a top-notch gadget. Excellent. I love the fact they introduce it early so you know what it is going on and you know what it does, and then it does it for the whole movie, and it's great. And you get uh, a fake out with the boat, with the croc scene, but you get the actual, like, it does bring the bullet, so the whole, it could deflect the bullet. It doesn't deflect the bullet, but it brings one to him. Um, I don't know if you would count the hang glider. Not really, but it is kind of one of those moments. The the pressurized bullets, the shark gun. It's not really a big I mean, factor, but it leads to a funny death. So I like it. Yeah, I mean, it's the climb. It's the it's the ultimate climax. It's the it's the thing that kills the the villain in the end. So yeah, it's it's an important gadget. Is that it? Oh no, we got the genuine Felix lighter in the car. I enjoy that. <laughs> yeah. Pop just for the pun. <laughs> Uh, on the girls, we've got Miss Caruso. She's just, you know, a, a woman to bed at the beginning of it. She's not really that much of a factor. Um, we're all going thumbs down on Rosie, right? Yeah. Yeah, just because she was so inept. I mean, because you can kind of see past the ineptness because she was not actually a CIA agent. But then you kind of think, well, why did Kananga use her instead? Couldn't she find someone that could actually do the job properly? Right. And, uh... I go thumbs up on Solitaire. Thumbs all the way up. Gorgeous. She played her role right in the film. You know, I, I really enjoyed Solitaire. And I go like a slight thumbs up. She's pretty much like useless in the movie. I mean, it's she's good a eye big, candy though. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Bond renders her useless by fucking her. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, she's she's in it the entire movie. You get to know about her. She plays the role well enough. It's not there's no like offense to like Jane Seymour or anything like that. It just feels like the character was a bit inert, really. Well, I imagine if he would have done that with other people in the series, like uh, Pussy Galore has sex with Bond, and she's like, I don't remember how to fly a plane. <laughs> just like <laughs> any skills that they have, they lose immediately. Doctor Christmas Jones, when we get to her, she's like, I'm a nuclear physicist, and they sleep I mean, together, and he's she's just sort of like. What's radiation? <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I mean, in Pussy Galore's defense, like the plane windows had all been knocked out when she was trying to fly that plane. So, yeah, I mean, she, the reason why she's, she's got the skills practice. in that. She doesn't lose them. No. She just loses her preference. <laughs> um, on the Allies' side, we don't get Q. So that sucks. Mm -hmm. This is uh, one of the only ones that Q is not in. And um, we get M and we get Money Penny. M is a salty old man, and Money Penny is as helpful as ever. Yeah, they're fine. And again, it's it's hard to really rank them because they're in it for so so briefly. Yeah. How do you guys feel about Harry Strutter and Quarrel Jr. and Felix? Completely useless. Well, yeah, Felix, Str not so much, but yeah, the other Felix two is involved. I don't think he's. I don't think he does. He's still a bit incompetent. He doesn't really do everything correctly. Um. Strutter is completely useless. There's no reason for him to be in the movie other than the fact to say, hey, this black guy's all right. And, and Quarrel, uh, same thing. Meet yeah, the man Quarrel, who shares my hairbrush. <laughs> at least Quarrel does something in the movie in terms of like planting all the bombs. So he does help out. He is the one that rids all the heroin plants and stuff like that. So, so yeah, he, he is at least is actively involved and he survives. So that's good. Yeah, you know how like uh, in Dr. No, Quarrel's dad's like, I don't go there. There's a dragon there. And in this one, Quarles like, nobody goes up to there. She's got the powers of the Obia. And he's like, I know from my dad. I ain't fucking going there. <laughs> if there's an island that somebody has a legend and you die if you go there, staying away. That dragon killed my dad. I'm mean, doing that. Um, villains, we've got Whisper. I think he's great. He's a good henchman. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, good henchman. Uh, Teehee's great. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, Baron Sabadai, terrible kind of character, but great. I love him. Very charismatic, completely He's useless. Fun. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of uh, Kananga. Not as much Mr. Big, <laughs> but Kananga, you know, the, the complete package. I, I really like Kananga. He might be my favorite villain in the whole franchise so far. Yeah, I would agree with that statement. He seems. It's a shame that he's in a filler. Because he's a very good villain. Uh, action, humor. Um, 
I, I'm a little down on some of the action because I, I don't love the chase sequences in the films as much. I'm more into like the the fight sequences and the shooting sequences more than the the chases. And this is lots of chase, but they're good. They're fine. You know, there's better ones. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah the, the chases have got a lot of stuff going on in there. Bond himself in his actual action sequences where he's got a fight and stuff like that. I just think it's terrible. But he doesn't know how to. You can tell by this one. Maud has no idea how to fight. And uh, but the only really good one is the final fight with um, T. He. But other than that, his fights were very, very poorly choreographed. Yeah, um, I would agree with everything Callum just said there. I'm giving a thumbs up on the humor, though. <laughs> I mean, how can you not? <laughs> right? Yeah. But that's all this movie's got going for. <laughs> I think when it's all said and done, my favorite line is the sheer magnetism. Because <laughs> that's just so shitty. <laughs> no, I, I mean my favorite line is the bit where he's um, with Rosie and he says that uh, he wouldn't have he wouldn't have killed her before. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> before. That, that is the old that is the ultimate like. Okay, that's that's how Bond sees women like. Yeah, I certainly wouldn't have killed you before. Uh, you love Felix lawyer. So. Yeah, uh, there's so many good lines in this. Music, I don't really love. I don't like the score, and like we talked about the main theme, it's one of my lesser favorite ones. I still I think still, you're wrong for that, but I have it in my I, collection. Like I listen to it. I like the song, but I don't like it as a Bond theme. I yeah. I enjoyed the uh, the music. I just thought that they played "Live and Let Die" too much. Yeah, I, I just can't, I can't look beyond the "What Does It Matter to You" part. It just mm -hmm. it just irks me. So I love the rest of the song, and again, the music is like here or there for me. It doesn't really pay too much of an influence, but. Yeah, I, I can't give it a thumbs up based on just that one part of the song. It really, really just throws it off for me. Do, 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 do. The rest of it's great. Like, it's just that one part that just really makes me just go, oh, why do you do this? It's just, it might, it's not so much I hate it, it's more I'm just so disappointed by it. It feels like it's four different songs. Because yeah, you got, bit, like, yeah. the kind of more romantic one, you've got this boppy... Beatles kind of pop track. You got this sweeping action thing. You got this bang, bang kind of angry thing. It's like they wanted to do everything and they didn't decide on which facet they wanted to emphasize more. I forgot who you said said this, but whoever said that's good for a demo. Now when you do the real yeah. one, is the right way to go. Yeah, it was the director. And then Paul McCartney's like, no, this is what I want. <laughs> and can I guess like, I get it. I want it, you know. So are we going shaken, not stirred? I'm saying shaken. It's a fucking weird movie, but I love it. I'm saying stirred for now. I wonder if that'll change. <laughs> I think I'm just on the side of shaken right now, mainly because <laughs> the villains were so good. And I, I still think I would still consider Doctor No the shaken one. The only three that I consider the stirred of uh, from Russian with Love Diamonds are Forever and You Only Live Twice. And so, so if that's on the positive side of things, then so be it. So yeah, that's uh, it's Live and Let Die. It's one that is one of the more infamous, uh, famous, infamous. I don't know which one you would go with. Lots of people. It's one of their favorites. Lots of people. It would be like somewhere in the middle. Um, lots of people probably would have a lot of things that would hate about it uh, to varying extents um, make sure you guys let us know what you think about Live and Let Die in the comments and uh, if you are interested in following some more stuff you are not just checking out the Bond things that we have going on here but you want to follow us on other things I am at Tony Mango and I've got the other stuff that's on Fanboys Anonymous I've also got the stuff on SmartCatMoma.com for the pro wrestling stuff, go ahead and check out everything that's over there. Just go to smartoutmoment.com and you'll see the podcast stuff and the website stuff and everything and the Facebook and Twitter and blah, blah, blah. And um, these guys do stuff on the pro wrestling side as well. Rob? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Dude Felice. You can uh, follow me on Twitch at Dude Felice. I don't know if that'll be up by the time we're doing this. So just check that out. Uh, check me out on fightful.com. Check me out on WrestleZone.com. Check out the Paul Heyman Smackdown podcast in the archives. But to tell you more about that, 
Here's Cal Wiggins. Yeah, so by the time you listen to this, the uh, Paul Hammond's Back Down podcast is probably long gone at this point, well, at least a few weeks out, out of there. But that was when me and Rob went back into a like retro series where we checked out every episode of SmackDown that Paul Heyman was the head writer for. So, yeah, there's a good, like, probably around about 40 episodes there that you can check out on the smartcatmoment.com channel. Just a complete playlist there that you can listen to all the way through. Me and Rob will hopefully be kicking off another project soon. Maybe even by the time you've you're listening to this, we'll have that new project underway. But yeah, we're still going to be keeping doing some retro stuff over on the Smart Cat Moment side of things. So stay tuned for that, as well as every other thing we're doing every week and weekend, potentially when there's a big show going on. And check out all the articles on smartcatmoment.com. Power rankings is what I contribute, but there's a ton of weekly content going out there. So make sure you check that out and follow me on Twitter at weekmeister 14 and also stay tuned, everybody, because James Bond and the Reviewable Kill podcast will return with The Man with the Golden Gun. <laughs>